Dramatis Personae of Coriolanus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Coriolanus by William Shakespeare. Dramatis Personae. Caius Martius Coriolanus. Read by Duncan Pugh. Citizens. Read by Chuck Williamson. Read by Peter Makus. Read by Paddy Cunningham. Read by Joshua Letchford. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Read by Abai. Read by Tricia G. Read by Christine G. Cominius. Read by Bob Gonzalez. First conspirator, first officer, lieutenant, second senator, second serving man. Read by Todd. First lord. Read by Tricia G. First senator. Read by Philip O'Grady. First serving man. Read by Leonard Wilson. First soldier and herald. Read by John Fricker. Gentlewoman, second soldier, third lord, and young Coriolanus. Read by Martin Geeson. Junius Brutus. Read by Ron Altman. Menenius Agrippa. Read by Algy Pug. Roman and second conspirator. Read by Christine G. Second Lord. Read by Chuck Donovan. Second officer and second patrician. Read by Chuck Williamson. Sicinius Volutus. Read by Rick F. Third conspirator. Read by Heather Phillips. Third Roman. Read by Lucy Perry. Titus Lartius and Edele. Read by Delmar H. Dolbier. Tullus Aphidius. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Valeria. Read by Tiffany Halla Colonna. Virgilia. Read by Amy Graymore. Volsi. Read by Max Schollinger. Volumnia. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Narrated by Diana Meulinger. End of Dramatis Personae. Act One of Coriolanus by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act One, Scene One Rome, a street. Enter a company of mutinous citizens with staves, clubs, and other weapons. Before we proceed any further, hear me speak. 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 speak! 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 You are all resolved rather to die than to famish? Resolved! 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 resolved. 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 First, you know Caius Martius is chief enemy to the people. We know it! We know it! We know it! We know it! Let us kill him, and we'll have corn at our own price. Is it a verdict? No more talking on it. Let it be done. Away! Let it, Let it, it be done. 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 Away. 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 No way! No One word, good citizens. We are accounted poor citizens, the patricians good. What authority surfeits on would relieve us, if they would yield us but the superfluity, while it were wholesome? We might guess they relieved us humanely, but they think we are too dear. The leanness that afflicts us, the object of our misery, is as an inventory to particularize their abundance. Our sufferance is a gain to them. Let us revenge this with our pikes, ere we become rakes. For the gods know I speak this in hunger for bread, not in thirst for revenge. Would you proceed especially against Caius Martius? Against him first. He's a very dog to the commonality. Consider you what services he has done for his country? Very well, and could be content to give him good report for it. But that he pays himself with being proud. Nay, but speak not maliciously. I say unto you, what he hath done famously, he did it to that end. Though soft-conscious men can be content to say it was for his country, he did it to please his mother, and to be partly proud, which he is, even till the altitude of his virtue. 
what he cannot help in his nature, you account a vice in him. You must in no way say he is covetous. If I must not, I need not be barren of accusations. He hath faults with surplus to tire in repetition. Shouts within. What shouts are these? The other side of the city is risen. Why stay we prating here? To the capital! Come, 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 come. soft. Who comes here? Enter Menenius Agrippa. Worthy Menenius Agrippa, one that hath always loved the people. He's one honest enough. Would all the rest were so. What works, my countrymen in hand? Where go you with bats and clubs? The matter, speak, I pray you. Our business is not unknown to the Senate. They have had inkling this fortnight what we intend to do, which now will show em in deeds. They say poor suitors have strong breaths. They shall know we have strong arms, too. Why, masters, my good friends, mine honest neighbours, will you undo yourselves? We cannot, sir. We are undone already. I tell you, friends, most charitable care have the patricians of you. For your wants, your suffering in this dearth, you may as well strike at the heaven with your staves as lift them against the Roman state, whose course will on the way it takes, cracking ten thousand curbs of more strong link asunder than can ever appear in your impediment. For the dearth, the gods, not the patricians, make it, and your knees to them, not arms, must help. Alack, you are transported by calamity thither where more attends you, and you slander the helms of the state, who care for you like fathers, when you curse them as enemies. They ne'er cared for us yet. Suffer us to famish, and their stone houses crammed with grain. Make edicts for usury, to support usurers repeal daily any wholesome act established against the rich and provide more piercing statutes daily to chain up and restrain the poor if the wars eat us not up they will and there's all the love they bear us either you must confess yourself wondrous malicious or be accused of folly i shall tell you a pretty tale it may be you have heard it but, since it serves my purpose, I will venture to stale it a little more. Well, I'll hear it, sir. Yet you must not think to fob off our disgrace with a tale. But, an it please you, deliver. There was a time when all the body's members rebelled against the belly, thus accused it, that only like a gulf it did remain in the midst of the body, idle and unactive still cupboarding the viand, never bearing like labour with the rest, where the other instruments did see and hear, devise, instruct, walk, feel, and mutually participate, did minister unto the appetite and affection common of the whole body. The belly answered, Well, sir, what answer made the belly? Sir, I shall tell you. With a kind of smile, which ne'er came from the lungs, but even thus, for, look you, I may make the belly smile as well as speak. It tauntingly replied to the discontented members, the mutinous parts that envied his receipt. Even so most fitly as you malign our senators, for that they are not such as you. Your belly's answer, what? The kingly crowned head, the vigilant eye, the counsellor heart, the arm our soldier, our steed the leg, the tongue our trumpeter, with other muniments and petty helps in this our fabric, if that they— What then? For me this fellow speaks. What then? What then? Should by the cormant belly be restrained, who is the sink of the body? Well, what then? The former agents, if they did complain, what could the belly answer? I will tell you, if you bestow a small, of what you have little, patience a while, you'll hear the belly's answer. Year long about it. Note me this, good friend, your most grave belly was deliberate, not rash like his accusers, and thus answered. True is it, my incorporate friends, 
quoth he, that I receive the general food at first which you deliver upon, and fit it is, because I am the storehouse and the shop of the whole body. But, if you do remember, I send it through the rivers of your blood, even to the court, the heart, to the seat of the brain and though the cranks and offices of man the strongest nerves and small inferior veins from me receive that natural competency whereby they live and though that all at once you my good friends this says the belly mark me ay sir well well though all at once cannot see what i do deliver out to each yet i can make my audit up that all from me do back receive the flower of all and leave me but the bran what say you to it it was an answer how apply you this the senators of rome are this good belly and you the mutinous members for examine their counsels and their cares digest things rightly touching the wheel of the common you shall find no public benefit which you receive but it proceeds or comes from them to you and no way from yourselves what do you think you the great toe of this assembly i the great toe why the great toe for that being one of the lowest basest poorest of this most wise rebellion thou goest foremost thou rascal thou art worst in blood to run leads first to win some vantage but make you ready your stiff bats and clubs rome and her rats are at the point of battle the one side must have bail enter caius martius hail noble martius thanks what's the matter you dissentious rogues that rubbing the poor itch of your opinion make yourselves scabs we have ever your good word he that will give good words to thee will flatter beneath a boring what would you have you curs that like nor peace nor war the one affrights you the other makes you proud he that trusts to you where he should find you lions finds you hers where foxes geese you are no surer no than is the coal of fire upon the ice or hailstone in the sun your virtue is to make him worthy whose offence subdues him and curse that justice did it who deserves greatness deserves your hate and your affections are a sick man's appetite who desires most that which would increase his evil he that depends upon your favours swims with fins of lead and hews down oaks with rushes hang ye trust ye with every minute you do change your mind and call him noble that was now your hate him vile that was your garland what's the matter that in these several places of the city you cry against the noble senate who under the gods keep you in awe which else would feed on one another what's their seeking for corn at their own rates whereof they say the city is well stored hang em, they say they'll sit by the fire and presume to know what's done in the capitol who's like to rise who thrives and who declines side factions and give out conjectural marriages making parties strong and feebling such as stand not in their liking below their cobbled shoes they say there's grain enough would the nobility lay aside their ruth and let me use my sword i'll make a quarry with thousands of these quartered slaves as high as i could pick my lance nay these are all most thoroughly persuaded for though abundantly they lack discretion yet are they passing cowardly but i beseech you what says the other troop they are dissolved hang em they said they were an hungry sighed forth proverbs that hunger broke stone walls that dogs must eat that meat was made for mouths that the gods sent not corn for the rich men only with these shreds they vented their complainings which being answered and a petition granted them a strange one to break the heart of generosity and make bold power look pale they threw their caps as they would hang them on the horns of the moon shouting their emulation what is granted them five tribunes to defend their vulgar wisdoms of their own choice 
Wands Junius Brutus, Sicinius Velutus, and I know not, death. The rabble should have first unroofed the city, ere so prevailed with me. It will in time win upon power, and throw forth greater themes for insurrections arguing. This is strange. Go, get you home, you fragments. Enter a messenger hastily. Where's Caius Martius? Here. What's the matter? The news is, sir, the Volsies are in arms. I am glad on it. Then we shall have means to vent our musty superfluity. See, our best elders. Enter Comenius, Titus Lartius, and other senators. Martius, tis true that you have lately told us. The Volsius are in arms. They have a leader, Tullus Ophidius, that will put you to it. I sin in envying his nobility, and were I anything but what I am, I would wish me only he. You have fought together. Were half to half the world by the ears and he, upon my party I'd revolt to make only my wars with him. He is a lion that I am proud to hunt. Then, worthy Martius, attend upon Cominius to these wars. It is your former promise. Sir, it is, and I am constant. Titus, thou shalt see me once more strike at Tullus's face. What, art thou stiff, standest out? No, Caius Martius, I'll lean upon one crutch and fight with other. Ere stay behind this business. O oh, true bread! Your company to the capital, where I know our greatest friends attend us. To Comenius. Lead you on. To Martius. Follow, Comenius, we must follow you. A right worthy you priority. Noble Martius. To the citizens. Hence to your homes, be gone. Nay, let them follow. The Volsies have much corn. Take these rats thither to gnaw their garners. Worshipful mutiners, your valour puts well forth. Pray, follow. Citizens steal away, exeunt all but Cicinius and Brutus. Was ever man so proud as is this Martius? He has no equal. When we were chosen tribunes for the people, marked you his lip? and eyes nay but his taunts being moved he will not spare to gird the gods be mock the modest moon the present wars devour him he is grown too proud to be so valiant such a nature tickled with good success disdains the shadow which he treads on at noon but i do wonder his insolence can brook to be commanded under cominius fame at the which he aims in whom already he's well graced cannot better be held nor more attained than by a place below the first for what miscarries shall be the general's fault though he perform to the utmost of a man and giddy censure will then cry out of mertius oh if he had borne the business Besides, if things go well, opinion that so sticks on Martius shall of his demerits rob Cominius. Come, half all Cominius' honours are to Mertius, though Mertius earned them not, and all his faults to Mertius shall be honours, though indeed in aught he merit not. Let's hence, and hear how the dispatch is made and in what fashion more than his singularity he goes upon this present action let's along exeunt scene two corioli the senate house enter tullus aphidius and certain senators so your opinion is aphidius that they of rome are entered in our councils and know how we proceed is it not yours Whatever have been thought on in this state that could be brought to bodily act ere Rome had circumvention? Tis not four days gone since I heard thence. These are the words. I think I have the letter here. Yes, here it is. Reads. They have pressed a power, but it is not known whether for east or west. The dearth is great, the people mutinous, 
and it is rumoured, Cominius, Martius your old enemy, who is of Rome worse hated than of you, and Titus, a most valiant Roman, these three lead on this preparation whither tis bent. Most likely tis for you. Consider of it. Our army's in the field. We never yet made doubt, but Rome was ready to answer us. Nor did you think it folly to keep your great pretenses veiled till when they needs must show themselves, which in the hatching, it seemed, appeared to Rome. By the discovery we shall be shortened in our aim, which was to take in many towns ere almost Rome should know we were afoot. Noble Alphidius, take your commission, hie you to your bands. Let us alone to guard Corioli. If they set down before us, for the remove bring your army. But, I think, you'll find they've not prepared for us. Oh, doubt not that. I speak from certainties. Nay, more. Some parcels of their power are forth already and only hitherward. I leave your honours. If we and Caius Martius chance to meet, tis sworn between us we shall ever strike till one can do no more. The gods assist you. And keep your honours safe. Farewell. Farewell. Exeunt. Scene three. Rome. A room in Martius's house. Enter Volumnia and Virgilia. They set them down on two low stools, and so. I pray you, daughter, sing, or express yourself in a more comfortable sort. If my son were my husband, I should freelier rejoice in that absence wherein he won honour than in the embracements of his bed, where he would show most love. When yet he was but tender-bodied and the only son of my womb, when youth with comeliness plucked all gaze his way, when for a day of king's entreaties a mother should not sell him an hour from her beholding, I, considering how honour would become such a person, that it was no better than picture-like to hang by the wall, if renown made it not stir, was pleased to let him seek danger where he was like to find fame. To a cruel war I sent him, from whence he returned his brows bound with oak, I tell thee, daughter, I sprang not more joy at first hearing he was a man-child than now in first seeing he had proved himself a man. But had he died in the business, madam, how then? Then his good report should have been my son. I therein would have found issue. Hear me profess sincerely. Had I a dozen sons, each in my love alike, and none less dear than thine and my good Martius, I had rather had eleven die nobly for their country than one voluptuously surfeit out of action. Enter a gentlewoman. Madam, the Lady Valeria is come to visit you. Beseech you, give me leave to retire myself. Indeed you shall not. Methinks I hear hither your husband's drum. See him pluck Ophidius down by the hair as children from a bear, the Volsi shunning him. Methinks I see him stamp thus, and call thus, Come on, you cowards! You were got in fear, though you were born in Rome. His bloody brow with his mailed hand then wiping, Forth he goes, like to a harvest-man that's tasked to mow, Or all, or lose his hire. His bloody brow! O oh, Jupiter, no blood! Away, you fool! It more becomes a man than guilt his trophy. The breasts of Hecuba, when she did suckle Hector, looked not lovelier than Hector's forehead, when it spit forth blood at Grecian sword contemning. Tell Valeria we are fit to bid her welcome. Exit, gentlewoman. Heavens bless my lord from fell Ophidius. He'll beat Ophidius' head below his knee, and tread upon his neck. Enter Valeria, with an usher and gentlewoman. My ladies both, good day to you. Sweet madam. I am glad to see your ladyship. How do you both? You are manifest housekeepers. What are you sewing here? A fine spot in good faith. How does your little son? I thank your ladyship. Well, good madam. He had rather see the swords and hear a drum than look upon his schoolmaster. On oh, my word, the father's son. I'll swear tis a very pretty boy. On oh, my troth, I looked upon him a Wednesday half an hour together has such a confirmed countenance. I saw him run after a gilded butterfly, and when he caught it, he let it go again, and after it again, and over and over he comes, and again, catched it again. Or whether his fall enraged him, or how twas, he did so set his teeth and tear it. 
Oh, I warrant it, how he mammicked it. One on's father's moods. Indeed, la, tis a noble child. A crack, madam. Come, lay aside your stitchery. I must have you play the idle hussop with me this afternoon. No, good madam, I will not out of doors. Not out of doors? She shall, she shall. Indeed, no, by your patience. I'll not over the threshold till my lord return from the wars. Fie, you confine yourself most unreasonably. Come, you must go visit the good lady that lies in. I will wish her speedy strength, and visit her with my prayers, but I cannot go thither. Why, I pray you? Tis not to save labour, nor that I want love. You would be another Penelope. Yet they say all the yarn she spun in Ulysses' absence did but fill Ithaca full of moths. Come, I would your cambric were sensible as your finger, that you might leave pricking it for pity. Come, you shall go with us. No, good madam, pardon me. Indeed, I will not go forth. In truth, la, go with me, and I'll tell you excellent news of your husband. Oh, good madam, there can be none yet. Verily, I do not jest with you. There came news from him last night. Indeed, madam. In earnest, it's true. I heard a senator speak it. Thus it is. The Volsces have an army forth, against whom Cominius the general is gone, with one part of our Roman power. Your lord and Titus are set down before their city Corioli. They nothing doubt prevailing, and to make it brief wars. This is true, on mine honour, and so I pray go with us. Give me excuse, good madam. I will obey you in every thing hereafter. Let her alone, lady. As she is now, she will but disease our better mirth. In troth, I think she would. Fare you well, then. Come, good sweet lady. Prithee, Virgilia, turn thy solemnness out a door, and go along with us. No, at a word, madam. Indeed I must not. I wish you much mirth. Well, then, farewell. Exeunt. Scene four. Before Corioli. Enter, with drum and colours, Martius, Titus Lartius, captains and soldiers. To them a messenger. Yonder comes news, a wager they have met. My horse to yours? No. Tis done. Agreed. Say, has our general met the enemy? They lie in view, but have not spoke as yet. So the good horse is mine. I'll buy him, have you? No. I'll nor sell nor give him. Lend you him, I will, for half a hundred years. Summon the town. How far off lie these armies? Within this mile and half. Then shall we hear their larum and they ours. Now, Mars, I prithee, make us quick in work, that we with smoking swords may march from hence to help our fielded friends. Come. Blow thy blast. They sound a parley. Enter two senators with others on the walls. Tullus Ophidius, is he within your walls? No, nor a man that fears you less than he. That's lesser than a little. Drums afar off. Hark, our drums are bringing forth our youth. We'll break our walls, rather than they shall pound us up. Our gates, which yet seem shut, we have but pinned with rushes. They'll open of themselves. Alarum afar off. Hark you, far off. There is Ophidius. List what work he makes amongst your cloven army. Oh, they are at it. Their noise be our instruction. Ladders, ho! Enter the army of the Volsces. They fear us not, but issue forth their city. Now put your shields before your hearts and fight with hearts more proof than shields. Advance, brave Titus. They do disdain us much beyond our thoughts, which makes me sweat with wrath. Come on, my fellows. He that retires I'll take him for a Volsi, and he shall feel mine edge. Alarum. The Romans are beat back to their trenches. Re-enter Martius, cursing. All the contagion of the south light on you, you shames of Rome, you herd of boils and plagues plaster you o'er that you may be abhorred further than seen and one infect another against the wind a mile. 
you souls of geese that bear the shapes of men how have you run from slaves that apes would beat pluto and hell all hurt behind backs red and faces pale with flight and aged fear mend and charge home or by the fires of heaven i leave the foe and make my wars on you look to it come on if you'll stand fast we'll beat them to their wives as they us to our trenches followed another alarum the wolsey's fly and martius follows them to the gates so now the gates are ope now prove good seconds tis for the followers fortune widens them not for the flyers mark me and do the like enters the gate full heartiness not i nor i martius is shut in see they have shut him in to the part i'll warrant him alarum continues re-enter titus lartius what has become of martius slain sir doubtless following the flyers at the very heels with them he enters who upon the sudden clap to their gates he is himself alone to answer all the city o oh, noble fellow who sensibly out dares his senseless sword and when it bows stands up thou art left martius a carbuncle entire as big as thou art were not so rich a jewel thou wast a soldier even to cato's wish not fierce and terrible only in strokes but with thy grim looks and the thunder-like percussion of thy sounds thou madest thine enemies shake as if the world were feverous and did tremble re-enter martius bleeding assaulted by the enemy look sir oh tis martius let's fetch him off or make remain alike they fight and all enter the city scene five corioli a street enter certain romans with spoils this will i carry to rome and i this a murinant i took this for silver Elerum continues still afar off enter martius and titus lartius with a trumpet see here these movers that do prize their hours at a cracked drachma cushions leaden spoons irons of a doit doublets that hangmen would bury with those that wore them these base slaves ere yet the fight be done pack up down with them and hark what noise the general makes to him there is the man of my soul's hate ophidius piercing our romans then valiant titus take convenient numbers to make good the city whilst i with those that have the spirit will haste to help cominius worthy sir thou bleedst thy exercise hath been too violent for a second course of fight sir praise me not my work hath yet not warmed me fare you well the blood i drop is rather physical than dangerous to me to ophidius thus i will appear and fight now the fair goddess fortune fall deep in love with thee and her great charms misguide thy opposer's swords bold gentlemen prosperity be thy page thy friend no less than those she placeth highest so farewell thou worthiest martius exit martius go sound thy trumpet in the market-place call thither all the officers of the town where they shall know our mind away exeunt scene six near the camp of cominius enter cominius as it were in retire with soldiers breathe you my friends well fought we are come off like romans neither foolish in our stands nor cowardly in retire believe me sirs we shall be charged again whiles we have struck by interims and conveying gusts we have heard the charges of our friends ye roman gods lead their successes as we wish our own that both our powers with smiling fronts encountering may give you thankful sacrifice enter a messenger thy news the citizens of corioli have issued and given to titus and to martius battle i saw our party to their trenches driven and then i came away though thou speak'st truth methinks thou speak'st not well how long is't since above an hour my lord tis not a mile briefly we heard their drums 
How couldst thou in a mile confound an hour, And bring thy news so late? Spies of the Volsies held me in chase, That I was forced to wheel three or four miles about, Else had I, sir, half an hour since brought my report. Who's yonder? That does appear as he were flayed? Oh, gods! He has the stamp of Martius, And I have before time seen him thus. Within. Come I too late? The shepherd knows not thunder from a tabor, More than I know the sound of Martius' tongue From every meaner man. Enter Martius. Come I too late? Ay, if you come not in the blood of others, But mantled in your own. Oh, let me clip ye in arms as sound as when I wooed, In heart as merry as when our nuptial day was done, And tapers burned to bedward. Flower of warriors, how is it with Titus? As with a man busied about decrees, Condemning some to death and some to exile, Ransoming him or pitying, threatening the other, Holding Corioli in the name of Rome, even like a fawning greyhound in the leash, to let him slip at will. Where is that slave which told me they had beat you to your trenches? Where is he? Call him hither. Let him alone. He did inform the truth. But for our gentlemen, the common file, a plague. Tribunes for them? The mouse ne'er shunned the cat as they did budge from rascals worse than they. But how prevailed you? Will the time serve to tell? I do not think. Where is the enemy? Are you lords of the field? If not, why cease you till you are so? Martius, we have at disadvantage fought, And did retire to win our purpose. How lies their battle? Know you on which side they have placed their men of trust? As I guess, Martius, their bands in the vaward Are the antieties of their best trust. O'er them, Aufidius, their very heart of hope. I do beseech you, by all the battles wherein we have fought, by the blood we have shed together, by the vows we have made to endure friends, that you directly set me against Aufidius and his antiates, and that you not delay the present, but, filling the air with swords advanced and darts, we prove this very hour. Though I could wish you were conducted to a gentle bath and balms applied to you, yet dare I never deny your asking. Take your choice of those that best can aid your action. Those are they that most are willing, if any such be here, as it were sin to doubt, that love this painting wherein you see me smeared, if any fear lesser his person than an ill report, if any think brave death outweighs bad life, and that his country's dearer than himself, let him alone, or so many so-minded, wave thus to express his disposition, and follow Martius. They all shout and wave their swords, take him up in their arms, and cast up their caps. O oh, me alone! Make you a sword of me? If these shows be not outward, which of you but his four volsies? None of you, but is able to bear against the great Ophidius a shield as hard as his, a certain number, though thanks to all must I select from all, the rest shall bear the business in some other fight, as cause will be obeyed. Please you to march, and four shall quickly draw out my command, which men are best inclined. March on, my fellows, make good this ostentation, and you shall divide in all with us. Exeunt. Scene 7. The Gates of Corioli. Titus Lartius, having set a guard upon Corioli, going with drum and trumpet towards Cominius, and Caius Martius enters with lieutenant, other soldiers, and a scout. So, let the ports be guarded. Keep your duties as I have set them down. If I do send, dispatch those centuries to our aid. The rest will serve for a short holding. If we lose the field, we cannot keep the town. Fear not our care, sir. Hence, and shut your gates upon us. Our guider come to the Roman camp, conduct us. Exeunt. Scene 8. A Field of Battle. Alarum as in battle. 
Enter from opposite sides, Martius and Aphidius. I'll fight with none but thee, for I do hate thee worse than a promise-breaker. We hate alike. Not Afric owns a serpent I abhor more than thy fame and envy. Fix thy foot. Let the first butcher die the other's slave, and the gods doom him after. If I fly, Martius, hallow me like a hare. Within these three hours, Tullus, alone I fought in your Coriolai walls, and made what work I pleased. Tis not my blood wherein thou seest me mass, for thy revenge wrench up thy power to the highest. Wert thou the Hector that was the whip of your bragged progeny, thou shouldst not skate me here. They fight, and certain Vulces come to the aid of Aphidius. Martius fights till they be driven in breathless. Officious and not valiant, you have shamed me in your condemned seconds. Exeunt. Scene 9. The Roman Camp. Flourish. Alarum. A retreat is sounded. Flourish. Enter from one side, Cominius with the Romans. From the other side, Martius with his arm in a scarf. If I should tell thee o'er this thy day's work, thou'lst not believe thy deeds. But I'll report it where senators shall mingle tears with smiles, where great patricians shall attend and shrug, i the end admire, where ladies shall be frighted and gladly quaked hear more, where the dull tribunes that, with the fusty plebeians, hate thine honours, shall say against their hearts, We thank the gods our Rome hath such a soldier. Yet camest thou to a morsel of this feast, having fully dined before. Enter Titus Lartius, with his power from the pursuit. O oh, general, here is the steed, we the caparison, hadst thou beheld— Pray now, no more. My mother, who has a charter to extol her blood, when she does praise me, grieves me. I have done as you have done, that's what I can, induced as you have been. That's for my country. He that has but effected his good will hath overtaken mine act. You shall not be the grave of your deserving. Rome must know the value of her own. Twere a concealment worse than a theft, no less than a traducement to hide your doings, and to silence that which, to the spire and top of praises vouched, would seem but modest. Therefore I beseech you, in sign of what you are, not to reward what you have done, before our army hear me. I have some wounds upon me, and they smart to hear themselves remembered. Should they not, well might they fester against ingratitude, and tent themselves with death. Of all the horses, whereof we have ta'en good and good store, of all the treasure in this field achieved and city, we render you the tenth, to be ta'en forth before the common distribution at your only choice. I thank you, General, but cannot make my heart consent to take a bribe to pay my sword. I do refuse it, and stand upon my common part with those that have beheld the doing. A long flourish. They all cry, cast up their caps and lances. Cominius and Titus stand bare. May these same instruments which you profane never sound more when drums and trumpets shall if the field prove flatterers let courts and cities be made all a false-faced soothing when steel grows soft as the parasite's silk let him be made a coverture for the wars no more i say for that i have not washed my nose that bled or foiled some debile wretch which without note here's many else have done you shout me forth in acclamations hyperbolical as if i loved my little should be dieted in praises sourced with lies too modest are you more cruel to your good report than grateful to us that give you truly by your patience if gainst yourself you be incensed we'll put you like one that means his proper harm in manacles then reason safely with you therefore be it known as to us to all the world that caius martius wears this war's garland in token of the which my noble steed known to the camp i give him with all his trim belonging and from this time 
for what he did before Corioli, call him, with all the applause and clamor of the host, Caius, Martius, Coriolanus, bear the addition nobly ever. Flourish, trumpets sound, and drums. Caius, Martius, Coriolanus. I will go wash, and when my face is fair, you shall perceive whether I blush or no. How be it? I thank you, I mean to stride your steed, and at all times to undercrest your good addition to the fairness of my power. So to our tent, where, ere we do repose us, we will write to Rome of our success. You, Titus, must to Corioli back, send us to Rome the best, with whom we may articulate for their own good and ours. I shall, my lord. The gods begin to mock me. I, that now refused most princely gifts, am bound to beg of my lord general. Take it, tis yours, what is't? I sometime lay here in Corioli, at a poor man's house. He used me kindly, he cried to me. I saw him prisoner, but then Ophidius was within my view, and wrath o'erwhelmed my pity. I request you to give my poor host freedom. Oh, well begged! Were he the butcher of my son, he should be free as is the wind. Deliver him, Titus. Martius, his name! By Jupiter, forgot. I am weary, yea, my memory is tired. Have we no wine here? Go we to our tent. The blood upon your visage dries. Tis time it should be looked to. Come. Exeunt. Scene 10. The Camp of the Woolseys. A flourish, cornets. Enter Tullius Ophidius, bloody, with two or three soldiers. The town is tain. Twill be delivered back on good condition. Condition? I would I were a Roman, for I cannot, being a Volsha, be that I am. Condition? What good condition can a treaty find to the part that is at mercy? Five times, Martius, I have fought with thee. So often hast thou beat me, and wouldst do so, I think, should we encounter as often as we eat. By the elements, if e'er again I meet him beard to beard, he's mine, or I am his. Mine emulation hath not that honour in't it had. For where I thought to crush him in an equal force, true sword to sword, I'll potch at him some way, or wrath or craft may get him. He's the devil. Bolder, though not so subtle. My valour's poisoned with only suffering stain by him, for him shall fly out of itself, nor sleep nor sanctuary, being naked, sick, nor fain, nor capital, the prayers of priests nor times of sacrifice, embarkments all of fury, shall lift up their rotten privilege and custom gainst my hate to Martius. Where I find him, were it at home, upon my brother's guard, even there, against the hospitable cannon, would I wash my fierce hand in's heart. Go you to the city, learn how tis held, and what they are that must be hostages for Rome. Will not you go? I am attended at the cypress grove. I pray you, tis south the city mills. Bring me word thither how the world goes, that to the pace of it I may spur on my journey. I shall, sir. Exeunt. End of Act One Act Two of Coriolanus by William Shakespeare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One Rome a public place. Enter Menenius with the two tribunes of people, Sicinius and Brutus. The augurer tells me we shall have news tonight. Good or bad? Not according to the prayer of the people, for they love not Martius. Nature teaches beasts to know their friends. Pray you, who does the wolf love? The lamb. I to devour him, as the hungry plebeians would the noble Martius. He's a lamb indeed that bays like a bear. He's a bear indeed that lives like a lamb. You two are old men. Tell me one thing that I shall ask you. Well, sir. Well, sir? 
in what enormity is Marcius poor in that you two have not in abundance? He's poor in no one fault, but stored with all, especially in pride, and topping all others in boasting. This is strange now. Do you two know how you are censured here in the city? I mean us of the right-hand file? Do you? Why, how are we censured? Because you talk of pride now. Will you not be angry? Well, well, sir, well. Why, it is no great matter, for a very little thief of occasion will rob you of a great deal of patience. Give your dispositions the reins, and be angry at your pleasures. At the least, if you take it as a pleasure to you in being so. You blame Martius for being proud? We do it not alone, sir. I know you can do very little alone, for your helps are many, or else your actions would grow wondrous single. Your abilities are too infant-like for doing much alone. You talk of pride. Oh, that you could turn your eyes toward the napes of your necks, and make but an interior survey of your good selves. Oh, that you could. What then, sir? Why, then, you should discover a brace of unmeriting, proud, violent, testy magistrates, alias fools, as any in Rome. Meninius, you are known well enough, too. I am known to be a humorous patrician, and one that loves a cup of hot wine with not a drop of a laying tiber in it, said to be something imperfect in favouring the first complaint, hasty and tinder-like upon too trivial motion, one that converses more with the buttock of the night than with the forehead of the morning, what I think I utter, and spend my malice in my breath. Meeting two such wheelsmen as you are, I cannot call you like Herguses. If the drink you give me touch my palate adversely, I make a crooked face at it. I can't say your worships have delivered the matter well, when I find the ass in compound with the major part of your syllables and though I must be content to bear with those that say you are reverend, grave men, yet they lie deadly that tell you you have good faces. If you see this in the map of my microcosm, follows it that I am known well enough to? What balm can your bison conspicuities glean out of this character if I be known well enough to? Come, sir, come, we know you well enough. You know neither me, yourselves, nor anything, you are ambitious for poor knaves' caps and legs. You wear out a good, wholesome forenoon in hearing a cause between an orange wife and a fosset seller, and then rejourn the controversy of three pence to a second day of audience. When you are hearing a matter between party and party, if you chance to be pinched with the colic, you make faces like mummers, set up the bloody flag against all patients, and in roaring for a chamber pot, Dismiss the controversy bleeding the more entangled by your hearing. All the peace you make in their cause is calling both the parties knaves. You are a pair of strange ones. Come, come, you are well understood to be a perfecter jiber for the table than a necessary bencher in the capital. Our oh, very priests must become mockers if they shall encounter such ridiculous subjects as you are. When you speak best unto the purpose, it is not worth the wagging of your beards, and your beards deserve not so honourable a grave as to stuff a botcher's cushion, or to be entombed in an ass's pack-saddle. Yet you must be saying, Martius is proud, who, in a cheap estimation, is worth predecessor since Deucalion, though peradventure some of the best of them were hereditary hangmen. Good den to your worships. More of your conversation would infect my brain, being the herdsman of the beastly plebeians. I will be bold to take my leave of you. Brutus and Sicinius go aside. Enter Volumnia, Virgilia, and Valeria. How now, my as fair as noble ladies? And the moon, were she earthly, no nobler? Whither do you follow your eyes so fast? Honourable Meninius, my boy Martius approaches. For the love of Juno, let's go. Ah, Martius coming home. Ay, worthy Meninius, and with most prosperous approbation. 
Take my cap, Jupiter, and I thank thee. Who? Martius coming home. Nay, tis true. Look, here's a letter from him. The state hath another, his wife another, and I think there's one at home for you. I will make my very house real to-night. A letter for me. Yes, certain is a letter for you. I sought. A letter for me. It gives me an estate of seven years' health, in which time I will make a lip at the physician. The most sovereign prescription in Galen is but impericutic, and to this preservative of no better report than a horse drench. Is he not wounded? He is wont to come home wounded. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, he is wounded. I thank the gods for it. So do I, too, if it be not too much. Brings a victory in his pocket? The wounds become him. Un's brows. Menenius, he comes the third time home with the oaken garland. Has he disciplined Ophidius soundly? Titus Lartius writes they fought together, but Ophidius got off. And twas time for him, too, I'll warrant him that. And had he stayed by him, I would not have been so fiducid for all the chests in Coriolai, and the gold that's in them. Is the Senate possessed of this? Good ladies, let's go. Yes, 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 the Senate has letters from the General, wherein he gives my son the whole name of the war. He hath in this action outdone his former deeds doubly. In troth, there's wondrous things spoke of him. Wondrous? Ay, I warrant you, and not without his true purchasing. The gods grant them true. True? Pow-wow! True, I'll be sworn they are true. Where is he wounded? To the tribunes. God save your good worships. Martius is coming home. He has more cause to be proud. Where is he wounded? I the shoulder, and in the left arm there will be large cicatrices to show the people, when he shall stand for his place. He received in the repulse of Tarquin seven hurts of the body. One in the neck, and two in the thigh. There's nine that I know. He had, before this laxed expedition, twenty-five wounds upon him. Now it's twenty-seven. Every gash was an enemy's grave. A shout and flourish. Hark! The trumpets! These are the ushers of Martius. Before him he carries noise, and behind him he leaves tears. Death, that dark spirit, in his nervy arm doth lie, which being advanced declines, and then men die. A senate. Trumpets sound. Enter Cominius the general, and Titus Lartius. Between them Coriolanus, crowned with an oaken garland, with captains and soldiers, and a herald. No, at Rome, that all alone Martius did fight within Corioli gates, where he hath won with fame a name to Caius Martius. These in honour follows Coriolanus. Welcome to Rome, renowned Coriolanus. Flourish. Welcome, Welcome to, to Rome, Rome, renowned, renowned Coriolanus. Coriolanus. No more of this. It does offend my heart. Pray now, no more. Look, sir, your mother. Oh, you have, I know, petitioned all the gods for my prosperity. Kneels. Nay, my good soldier, up, my gentle Martius, worthy Caius, and by deed achieving honour newly named. What is it? Coriolanus, must I call thee? But, oh, thy wife! My gracious silence, hail! Wouldst thou have laughed had I come coffined home? that weepest to see me triumph? Ay, my dear, such eyes the widows in Corioli were, and mothers that lack sons. Now the gods crown thee. And live you yet? To Valeria. O oh, my sweet lady, pardon. I know not where to turn. O oh, welcome home, and welcome general, and your welcome all. A hundred thousand welcomes, I could weep and I could laugh. I am light and heavy. Welcome. A curse begins at very root on's heart that is not glad to see thee. You are three that Rome should dote on. Yet by the faith of men we have some old crab-trees here at home that will not be grafted to your relish. Yet welcome, warriors. 
We call a nettle but a nettle, and the faults of fools but folly. Ever right. Menenius, ever, ever. Give way there, and go on. To Alumnia and Virgilia. Your hand, and yours. Ere in our own house I do shade my head, the good patricians must be visited, from whom I have received not only greetings, but with them change of honours. I have lived to see inherited my very wishes, and the buildings of my fancy. Only there's one thing wanting, which I doubt not but our Rome will cast upon thee. No, good mother, I had rather be their servant in my way, than sway with them in theirs. On to the capital. Flourish. Cornets. Exeunt in state as before. Brutus and Sicinius come forward. All tongues speak of him, and the bleared sights a spectacle to see him. Your prattling nurse into a rapture lets her baby cry while she chats him. The kitchen malkin pins her richest lockrum bout her reachy neck, clamoring the walls to eye him. Stalls, bulks, windows are smothered up, leads filled and ridges horsed with variable complexions, all agreeing in earnestness to see him. Seld shown flamens do press among the popular throngs and puff to win a vulgar station. Or veiled dames commit the war of white and damask in their nicely gauded cheeks to the wanton spoil of Phoebus's burning kisses. Such a pother as if that whatsoever god who leads him was silly crept into his human powers and gave him graceful posture. On the sudden I warned him counsel. Then our office may, during his power, go sleep. He cannot temperately transport his honours from where he should begin and end, but will lose those he hath won. In that there's comfort. Doubt not the commoners, for whom we stand, but they, upon their ancient malice, will forget with the least cause these his new honours, which that he will give them make I as little question as he is proud to do't. I heard him swear were he to stand for counsel, never would he appear in the market-place, nor on him put the napless vesture of humility, nor showing, as the manner is, his wounds to the people, beg their stinking breaths. Tis right. It was his word. Oh, he would miss it rather than carry it but by the suit of the gentry to him, and the desire of the nobles. I wish no better than have him hold that purpose, and to put it in execution. Tis most like he will. It shall be to him, then, as our good wills, a sure destruction. So it must fall out to him or our authorities. For an end we must suggest the people in what hatred he still hath held them, that to his power he would have made them mules, silenced their pleaders, and dispropertied their freedoms, holding them in human action and capacity, of no more soul nor fitness for the world than camels in the war, who have their provand only for bearing burdens, and sore blows for sinking under them. This, as you say, suggests that at some time when his soaring insolence shall touch the people, which time shall not want, if he be put upon it, and that's as easy as to set dogs on sheep, and will be his fire to kindle their dry stubble, and their blaze shall darken him for ever. Enter a messenger. You were sent for to the capital. Tis thought that Coriolanus shall be consul. I have seen the dumb men throng to see him, and the blind to hear him speak. Matrons flung gloves, ladies and maids their scarfs and handkerchiefs, upon him as he passed. The nobles bended as to Jove's statue, and the commons made a shower and thunder with their caps and shouts. I never saw the like. Let's to the capital, and carry with us ears and eyes for the time, but hearts for the event. Have with you. Exeunt. Scene two. The same. The capital. Enter two officers to lay cushions. Come, come, they are almost here. How many stand for consulships? 
three they say but tis thought of every one coriolanus will carry it that's a brave fellow but he's vengeance proud and loves not the common people faith there have been many great men that have flattered the people who ne'er loved them and there be many that they have loved they know not wherefore so that if they love they know not why they hate upon no better a ground therefore for coriolanus neither to care whether they love or hate him manifests the true knowledge he has in their disposition and out of his noble carelessness lets them plainly see it if he did not care whether he had their love or no he waved indifferently twixt doing them neither good nor harm but he seeks their hate with greater devotion than can render it him and leaves nothing undone that may fully discover him their opposite now to seem to affect the malice and displeasure of the people is as bad as that which he dislikes to flatter them for their love he hath deserved worthily of his country and his ascent is not by such easy degrees as those who having been supple and courteous to the people bonneted without any further deed to have them at all into their estimation and report but he hath so planted his honours in their eyes and his actions in their hearts that for their tongues to be silent and not confess so much were a kind of ingrateful injury to report otherwise were a malice that giving itself the lie would pluck reproof and rebuke from every ear that heard it no more of him he is a worthy man make way they are coming a senate enter with actors before them cominius the consul meninius coriolanus senators sicinius and brutus the senators take their places the tribunes take their places by themselves coriolanus stands having the turban of the volsces and descend for titus it remains as the main point of this our after meeting to gratify his noble service that hath thus stood for his country therefore please you most reverend and grave elders to desire the present consul and last general in our well-found successors to report a little of that worthy work performed by caius marcius whom we met here both to thank and to remember with honours like himself speak good cominius leave nothing out for length and make us think rather our states defective for acquittal than we to stretch it out to the tribunes masters of the people we do request your kindest ears and after your loving motion toward the common body to yield what passes here we are convented upon a pleasing treaty and have hearts inclinable to honour and advance the theme of our assembly which the rather we shall be blessed to do if he remember a kinder value of the people than he hath hereto prized them at that's off that's off i would you rather had been silent please you to hear cominius speak most willingly but yet my caution was more pertinent than the rebuke you give it he loves your people but tie him not to be their bedfellow worthy cominius speak coriolanus offers to go away nay keep your place sit coriolanus never shame to hear what you have nobly done your honest pardon i had rather have my wounds to heal again than hear say how i got them sir i hope my words disbenched you not no sir yet oft when blows have made me stay i fled from words you soothe not therefore hurt not but your people i love them as they weigh pray now sit down i had rather have once scratched my head i the sun when the alarum was struck than idly sit to hear my nothings monstered exit masters of the people your multiplying spawn how can he flatter that's thousand to one good one when you now see he had rather venture all his limbs for honour than one on's ears to hear it proceed cominius i shall lack voice the deeds of coriolanus should not be uttered feebly it is held that valour is the chiefest virtue and most dignifies the haver if it be 
The man I speak of cannot in the world be singly counterpoised. At sixteen years, when Tarquin made a head for Rome, he fought beyond the mark of others. Our then dictator, whom with all praise I point at, saw him fight, when with his Amazonian chin he drove the bristled lips before him, be bestrid an o'er-pressed Roman, and i' the consul's view slew three opposers. Tarquin's self he met, and struck him on his knee. In that day's feats, when he might act the woman in the scene, he proved best man i' the field, and for his mead was brow-bound with the oak. His pupil age, man entered thus, he waxed like a sea, and in the brunt of seventeen battles since he lurched all swords of the garland. For this last, before and in Corioli, let me say, I cannot speak him home. He stopped the flyers, and by his rare example made the coward turn terror into sport. As weeds before a vessel under sail, so men obeyed and fell below his stem. His sword, death's stamp, where it did mark it took. From face to foot he was a thing of blood, whose every motion was timed with dying cries. Alone he entered the mortal gate of the city, which he painted with shunless destiny, aidless came off, and with a sudden reinforcement struck Corioli like a planet. Now all's his when by and by the din of war gan pierce his ready sense, then straight his doubled spirit requickened what in flesh was fatigate, and to the battle came he, where he did run reeking o'er the lives of men, as if twere a perpetual spoil, until we called both field and city ours, he never stood to ease his breast with panting. Worthy man! He cannot but with measure fit the honours, which we devise him. Our spoils he kicked at, and looked upon things precious as they were the common muck of the world. He covets less than misery itself would give, rewards his deeds with doing them, and is content to spend the time to end it. He's right noble. Let him be called for. Call Coriolanus. He doth appear. Re-enter Coriolanus. The Senate, Coriolanus, are well pleased to make thee consul. I do owe them still my life and services. It then remains that you do speak to the people. I do beseech you, let me all leap that custom, for I cannot put on the gown, stand naked, and entreat them. For my wound's sake, to give their suffrage, please you that I may pass this doing. Sir, the people must have their voices. Neither will they bait one jot of ceremony. Put them not to it. Pray you, go fit you to the custom, and take to you, as your predecessors have, your honour with your form. It is a part that I shall blush in acting, and might well be taken from the people. Mark you that? To brag unto them, thus I did, and thus, show them the unaching scars which I should hide, as if I had received them for the hire of their breath only. Do not stand upon it. We recommend to you, tribunes of the people, our purpose to them, and to our noble consul wish we all joy and honour. Flourish of cornets, exeunt all but Sicinius and Brutus. You see how he intends to use the people. May they perceive intent. He will require them, as if he did contemn what he requested should be in them to give. Come. We'll inform them of our proceedings here. On the marketplace, I know, they do attend us. Exeunt. Scene three. The same. The forum. Enter seven or eight citizens. Once, if he do require our voices, we ought not to deny him. We may, sir, if we will. We have power in ourselves to do it, but it is a power that we have no power to do. For if he show us his wounds and tell us his deeds, we had to put our tongues into those wounds and speak for them. So if he tells his noble deeds, we must also tell him a noble acceptance of them. Ingratitude is monstrous, and for the multitude to be ungrateful were to make a monster of the multitude, of which we being members should bring ourselves to be monstrous members. And to make us no better thought of, a little help will serve. 
for once we stood up about the corn he himself stuck not to call us the many-headed multitude we have been called so of many not that our heads are some brown some black some auburn some bald but that our wits are so diversely coloured and truly i think if all our wits were to issue out of one skull they would fly east west north south and their consent of one direct way should be at once to all the points of the compass think you so which way do you judge my wit would fly nay your wit will not so soon out as another man's will tis strongly wedged up in a blockhead but if it were at liberty twould sure southward why that way to lose itself in a fog where being three parts melted away with rotten dews the fourth would return for conscience sake to help to get thee a wife you are never without your tricks you may you may are you all resolved to give your voices but that's no matter the greater part carries it i say if he would incline to the people there was never a worthier man enter coriolanus in a gown of humility with meninius here he comes and in the gown of humility mark his behaviour we are not to stay all together but to come by him where he stands by ones by twos and by threes he is to make his requests by particulars wherein every one of us has a single honour in giving him our own voices with our own tongues therefore follow me and i direct you how you shall go by him axiom citizens oh sir you are not right have you not known the worthiest men have done it what must i say i pray sir plague upon it i cannot bring my tongue to such a pace look sir my wounds i got them in my country's service when some certain of your brethren roared and ran from the noise of our own drums oh me the gods you must not speak of that you must desire them to think upon you think upon me hang em i would they would forget me like the virtues which our divines lose by them you'll mar all i'll leave you pray you speak to em i pray you in wholesome manner exit bid them wash their faces and keep their teeth clean re-enter two of the citizens so here comes a brace re-enter a third citizen you know the cause sir of my standing here we do sir tell us what hath brought you to it my own desert your own desert ay but not mine own desire how not your own desire no sir twas never my desire yet to trouble the poor with begging you must think if we give you anything we hope to gain by you well then i pray your price of the consulship the price is to ask it kindly kindly sir i pray let me hide it i have wounds to show you which shall be yours in private your good voice sir what say you you shall hear it with it sir a match sir there's in all two worthy voices begged i have your arms adieu but this is something odd and twere to give again but tis no matter axion the three citizens re-enter two other citizens pray you now if it may stand with the tune of your voices that i may be consul i have here the customary gown you have deserved nobly of your country and you have not deserved nobly your enigma you have been a scourge to her enemies you have been a rod to her friends you have not indeed loved the common people you should account me the more virtuous that i have not been common in my love i will sir flatter my sworn brother the people to earn a dearer estimation of them tis a condition they account gentle and since the wisdom of their choice is rather to have my hat than my heart i will practise the insinuating nod and be off to them most counterfeitly that is sir i will counterfeit the bewitchment of some popular man and give it bountiful to the desirers therefore beseech you i may be consul we hope to find you our friend and therefore give you our voices heartily you have received many wounds for your country i will not seal your knowledge with showing them i will make much of your voices and so trouble you no further the gods give you joy sir heartily Exeunt.
most sweet voices. Better it is to die, better to starve, than crave the hire which first we do deserve. Why in this wolvish toe should I stand here to beg of Hob and Dick that do appear their needless vouches? Custom calls me to it. What custom wills in all things should we do it? The dust on antique time would lie unswept, and mountainous error be too highly heaped for truth to all peer. Rather than fool it so, let the high office and the honour go to one that would do thus. I am half through. The one part suffered, the other will I do. Re-enter three citizens more. Here come more voices. Your voices, for your voices I have fought, watched for your voices, for your voices bare of wounds two dozen odd. Battles thrice six I have seen and heard of, for your voices have done many things, some less, some more your voices. Indeed, I would be consul. He has done nobly and cannot go without any honest man's voice. Therefore let him be consul. The gods give him joy and make him good friend to the people. Amen. 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 God, God save thee, thee noble, noble consul. consul. Exeunt. Worthy voices. Re-enter Meninius with Brutus and Sicinius. You have stood your limitation, and the tribunes endue you with the people's voice. Remains that, in the official marks invested, you anon do meet the Senate. Is this done? The custom of request you have discharged. The people do admit you, and are summoned to meet anon, upon your approbation. Where? At the Senate House? There, Coriolanus. May I change these garments? You may, sir. That I'll straight do, and knowing myself again, repair to the Senate House. I'll keep you company. Will you along? We stay here for the people. Fare you well. Exeunt Coriolanus and Meninius. He has it now, and by his looks me think tis warm at heart. With a proud heart he wore his humble weeds. Will you dismiss the people? Re-enter citizens. How now, my masters? Have you chose this man? He has our voices, sir. We pray the gods he may deserve your loves. Amen, sir. To my poor, unworthy notice, he mocked us when he begged our voices. Certainly, he flattered us downright. No, tis his kind of speech. He did not mock us. Not one amongst us, save yourself, but says he used us scornfully. He should have showed us his marks of merit, wounds received for his country. Why, so he did, I am sure. No, no, no man saw him. He said he had wounds, which he could show in private and with his hat thus waving it in scorn. I would be consul, says he. Aged custom, but by your voices will not so permit me. Your voices, therefore. When we granted that, here was, I thank you for your voices. Thank you, your most sweet voices. Now you have left your voices. I have no further with you. Was this not mockery? Why, either you were ignorant deceit, or, sing it, of such childish friendliness to yield your voices? Could you not have told him as you were lessened, when he had no power, but was a petty servant to the state? He was your enemy. Ever spake against your liberties and the charters that you bear in the body of the wheel. And now, arriving a place of potency and sway o'er the state, if he should still malignantly remain fast foe to the plebeal, your voices might be curses to yourselves? You should have said that as his worthy deeds did claim no less than what he stood for, so his gracious nature would think upon you for your voices and translate his malice towards you into love, standing your friendly lord. Thus to have said, as you were foreadvised, had touched his spirit and tried his inclination. From him plucked either his gracious promise, which you might, as cause had called you up, have held him to, or else it would have galled his surly nature, which easily endures not article tying him to aught. So putting him to rage, you should have taken the advantage of his collar and passed him unelected. 
Did you perceive he did solicit you in free contempt when he did need your loves? And do you think that his contempt shall not be bruising to you when he hath power to crush? Why, had your bodies no heart among you? Or had you tongues to cry against the rectorship of judgment? Have you ere now denied the asker, and now again of him that did not ask, but mock, bestow your sued for tongues? He's not confirmed. We may deny him yet. And will deny him. I'll have five hundred voices of that sound. I twice five hundred and their friends to piece em. Get you hence instantly, and tell those friends they have chose a consul that will from them take their liberties. Make them of no more voice than dogs that are as often beat for barking as therefore kept to do so. Let them assemble, and on a safer judgment all revoke your ignorant election, and force his pride and his old hate unto you. Besides, forget not with what contempt he wore the humble weed, how in his suit he scorned you. But your loves, thinking upon his services, took from you the apprehension of his present portents, which most jibingly, ungravely, he did fashion after the inveterate hate he bears you. Lay a fault on us, your tribunes, that we labored, no impediment between, but that you must cast your election on him. Say, you chose him more after our commandment than as guided by your own true affections, and that your minds, preoccupied with what you rather must do than what you should, made you against the grain to voice him counsel. Lay the fault on us. Ay, spare us not. Say we read lectures to you. How youngly he began to serve his country, how long continued, and what stock he springs of. The noble house of the Marsians, from whence came that Ancus Numa's daughter's son, who after great Hostilius here was king, of the same house Publius and Quintus were, that our beet water brought by conduits hither, and Censorinus, nobly named so, twice being by the people chosen censor, was his great ancestor. One thus descended, that hath beside well in his person wrought to be set high in place, we did commend to your remembrances. But you have found, scaling his present bearing with his past, that he's your fixed enemy, and revoke your sudden approbation. Say you ne'er had done't. Harp on that still. But by our putting on, and presently when you have drawn your number, repair to the capital. We will so. Almost all repent in their election. Exeunt citizens. Let them go on. This mutiny were better put in hazard than stay past doubt for greater. If, as his nature is, he fall in rage with their refusal, both observe and answer the vantage of his anger. To the capital, come. We will be there before the stream of the people, and this shall seem as partly tis, their own, which we have goaded onward. Exeunt. End of Act Two. Act Three of Coriolanus by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One, Rome, a street. Cornets, enter Coriolanus, Menenius, all the gentry, Cominius, Titus Lartius, and other senators. Tullus Aufidius then had made new head. He had, my lord, and that it was which caused our swifter composition. So then, the Volsci stand, but as at first, ready when time shall prompt them to make road upon us again. They are worn, Lord Consul, so that we may hardly in our ages see their banners wave again. Saw you, Ophidius? On safeguard he came to me, and did curse against the Volstes. So they had so vilely yielded the town. He is retired to Antium. Spoke he of me? He did, my lord. How? What? How often he had met you, sword to sword, that of all things upon the earth he hated your person most. 
that he would pawn his fortunes to hopeless restitution, so he might be called your vanquisher. At Antium lives he? At Antium. I wish I had a cause to seek him there, to oppose his hatred fully. Welcome home. Enter Sicinius and Brutus. Behold, these are the tribunes of the people, the tongues of the common mouth. I do despise them, for they do prank them in authority against all noble sufferance. Pass no further. Ha! What is that? It will be dangerous to go on. No further. What makes this change? The matter. Hath he not passed the noble and the common? Comenius, no. Have I had children's voices? Tribunes give way. He shall to the marketplace. The people are incensed against him. Stop, or all will fall in broil. Are these your herd? Must these have voices that can yield them now and straight disclaim their tongues? What are your offices? You being their mouths, why will you not their teeth? Have you not set them on? Be calm, be calm. It is a purposed thing and grows by plot to curb the will of the nobility. Suffer it and live with such as cannot rule, nor ever will be ruled. Call it not a plot. The people cry you mocked them, and of late when corn was given them gratis, you repined, scandaled the suppliants for the people, called them time-pleasers, flatterers, foes to nobleness. Why, this was known before. Not to them all. Have you informed them, Sithens? How? I informed them. You are like to do such business. Each way to better yours. Why then should I be consul? By yon clouds, let me deserve so ill as you, and make me your fellow tribune. You show too much of that for which the people stir. If you will pass to where you are bound, you must inquire your way, which you are out of, with a gentler spirit, or never be so noble as a council, nor yoke with him for tribune. Let's be calm. The people are abused, set on. This paltering becomes not Rome, nor has Coriolanus deserved this so dishonoured rub, laid falsely i' the plain way of his merit. Tell me of corn. This was my speech, and I will speak it again. Not now, not now. Not in this heat, sir, now. Now, as I live, I will. My nobler friends, I crave their pardons. For the mutable, rank-scented many, <laughs> let them regard me as I do not flatter, and therein behold themselves. I say again in soothing them, we nourish against our senate the cockle of rebellion, insolence, sedition, which we ourselves have ploughed for, sowed and scattered by mingling them with us, the honoured number who lack not virtue, no, nor power, but that which they have given to beggars. Well, no more. No more words, we beseech you. How? No more. As for my country, I have shed my blood, not fearing out with force, so shall my lungs coin words till their decay against those measles, which we disdain should tatter us, yet sought the very way to catch them. You speak of the people as if you were a god to punish, not a man of their infirmity. Twere well we let the people note. What? What? His collar? Collar? Were I as patient as the midnight sleep, by Jove, t'would be my mind. It is a mind that shall remain a poison where it is, not poison any further. Shall remain? Hear you this trison of the minnows? Mark you his absolute shall? T'was from the cannon. Shall? Oh, good but most unwise patricians! Why, you grave but reckless senators, have you thus given Hydra here to choose an officer, that with his peremptory shall, being but the horn and noise of the monsters, wants not spirit to say he'll turn your current in a ditch, and make your channel his? 
If he have power, then veil your ignorance. If none, awake your dangerous lenity. If you are learned, be not as common fools. If you are not, let them have cushions by you. You are plebeians if they be senators, and they are no less. When, both your voices blended, the greatest taste most palates theirs. They choose their magistrate, and such a one as he, who puts his shall, his popular shall, against a graver bench than ever frowned in Greece. By Jove himself, it makes the consul's base, and my soul aches to know, when two authorities are up, neither supreme, how soon confusion may enter twixt the gap of both, and take the one by the other. Well, on to the market-place. Whoever gave that counsel to give forth the corn of the storehouse gratis, as t'was used some time in Greece? Well, well, no more of that. Though there the people had more absolute power, I say they nourished disobedience, fed the ruin of the state. Why shall the people give one that speaks thus their voice? I'll give my reasons more worthier than their voices. They know the corn was not our recompense, resting well assured that ne'er did service for it. Being pressed to the war, even when the navel of the state was touched, they would not thread the gates. This kind of service did not deserve corn gratis. Being in the war, their mutinies and revolts, wherein they showed most valour, spoke not for them. The accusation which they have often made against the Senate, or cause unborn, could never be the motive of our so frank donation. Well, what then? How shall this bison multitude digest the Senate's courtesy? Let deeds express what's like to be their words. We did request it, we are the greater pearl, and in true fear they gave us our demands. Thus we debase the nature of our seats, and make the rabble call our cares fears, which will in time break ope the locks of the senate, and bring in the crows to peck the eagles. Come, enough! Enough with overmeasure. No, take more. What may be sworn by, both divine and human, seal what I end with all. This double worship, where one part does disdain with cause, the other insult without all reason, where gentry title wisdom, cannot conclude but by the yea and no of general ignorance. It must omit real necessities and give way the while to unstable slightness. Purpose so barred it follows. Nothing is done to purpose. Therefore beseech you, you that will be less fearful than discreet, that love the fundamental part of state more than you doubt the change on it, that prefer a noble life before a long, and wish to jump a body with a dangerous physic, that's sure of death without it. At once pluck out the multitudinous tongue, let them not lick the sweet which is their poison. Your dishonour mangles true judgment and bereaves the state of that integrity which should become it. Not having the power to do the good it would, for thee in which doth control it. Has said enough. Has spoken like a traitor, and shall answer as traitors do. Thou wretch, despite or whelm thee. What should the people do with these bold tribunes, on whom depending their obedience fails to the greater bench? In a rebellion, when what's not meet, but what must be was law, then were they chosen. In a better hour, let what is meet be said it must be meet, and throw their power i' the dust. Manifest treason! This a council? No. The Idiles, ho! Enter an Idile. Let him be apprehended. Go, call the people. Exit Idile. In whose name myself attach thee as a traitorous innovator, a foe to the public weal. Obey, I charge thee, and follow to thine answer. Hence, old goat. Aged sir, hands off. Hence, rotten thing, or I shall shake thy bones out of thy garments. Help, ye citizens! 
Enter a rebel of citizens, plebeians, with the Idolais. On both sides more respect. Here's he that would take from you all your power. Seize him, Idolais. What is about to be? I am out of breath. Confusion's near. I cannot speak. You, tribunes, to the people. Coriolanus, patience. Speak, good Sicinius. Hear me, people. Peace. Let's hear our tribute. Let's, Let's, hear. Hear. Let's hear. Let's hear. Let's hear. Let's hear. Speak. 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 You are at point to lose your liberties. Coriolanus would have all from you. Coriolanus, whom late you have named for counsel. Fie, fie, fie. This is the way to kindle, not to quench. To unbuild the city and to lay all flat. What is the city but the people? True, true, the true, people true, are the city. True, true. true, By the consent of all, we were established the people's magistrates. You so remain. And so I like to do. This is the way to lay the city flat, to bring the roof to the foundation, and bury all, which yet distinctly ranges in heaps and piles of ruin. This deserves death. Or let us stand to our authority, or let us lose it. We do here pronounce upon the part of the people in whose power we were elected theirs, Coriolanus is worthy of present death. Therefore lay hold of him, bear him to the rock Tarpeian, and from thence into destruction cast him. Idoles, seize him. Yield, Coriolanus, Hear me one word. Beseech you, tribunes, hear me but a word. Peace, peace. To Brutus. Be that you seem truly your country's friend, and temperately proceed to what you would thus violently redress. Sir, those cold ways that seem like prudent helps are very poisonous where the disease is violent. Lay hands upon him, and bear him to the rock. No, I'll die here. <laughs> Drawing his sword. There's some among you have beheld me fighting. Come, try upon yourselves what you have seen me. Down with that sword. Tribunes, withdraw a while. Lay hands upon him. Help Coriolanus. Help you that be noble. Help him, young and old. Down, down with him. Down, 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 down with him. him. In this mutiny, the tribunes, the Idolais, and the people are beat in. Go, get you to your house. Be gone. Away. All will be naught else. Get you gone. Stand fast. We have as many friends as enemies. Shall it be put to that? The gods forbid. I prithee, noble friend, home to thy house. Leave us to cure this cause. For tis a sore upon us. You cannot tent yourself. Be gone, beseech you. Come, sir, along with us. I would they were barbarians. As they are, though in Rome littered. Not Romans, as they are not, though carved in the porch of the Capitol. Be gone! Put not your worthy rage into your tongue. One time will owe another. On fair ground I could beat forty of them. I could myself take up a brace of the best of them, yea, the two tribunes. But now tis odds beyond arithmetic, and manhood is called foolery when it stands against a falling fabric. Will you hence, before the tag return, whose rage doth rend like interrupted waters, and o'erbear what they are used to bear? Pray you be gone. I'll try whether my old wit be in request with those that have but little. This must be patched with cloth of any colour. Nay, come away. Exeunt Coriolanus, Comenius, and others. This man has marred his fortune. His nature is too noble for the world. He would not flatter Neptune for his trident, or Jove's force power to thunder. His heart's his mouth. What his breast forges, that his tongue must vent, and, being angry, does forget that ever he heard the name of death. A noise within. Here's goodly work. I would they were a bed. I would they were in Tiber. What the vengeance! Could he not speak em fair? Re-enter Brutus and Sicinius with the rebel. 
Where is this viper that would depopulate the city and be every man himself? You worthy tribunes. He shall be thrown down the Tarpian rock with rigorous hands. He hath resisted law and therefore law shall scorn him further trial than the severity of the public power which he so sets at naught. He shall well know the noble tribunes are the people's mouths, and we their hands. He shall sure on it. Sir, sir. Peace. Do not cry havoc, where you should but hunt with modest warrant. Sir, how comest that you have hope to make this rescue? Hear me speak. As I do know the consul's worthiness, so can I name his faults. Consul? What consul? The consul Coriolanus. He, consul. No, 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 no. If by the tribune's leave, and yours, good people, I may be heard, I would crave a word or two. The which shall turn you to no further harm than so much loss of time. Speak briefly, then, for we are peremptory to dispatch this viperous traitor. To eject him hence were but one danger, and to keep him here are certain death. Therefore it is decreed he dies to-night. Now the good gods forbid that our renowned Rome, whose gratitude towards her deserved children is enrolled in Jove's own book, like an unnatural dam, should now eat up her own. He's a disease that must be cut away. Oh, he's a limb that has but a disease, mortal to cut it off, to cure it, easy. What has he done to Rome that's worthy death? Killing our enemies, the blood he hath lost, which, I dare vouch, is more than that he hath, by many an ounce, he dropped it for his country. And what is left, to lose it by his country, were to us all, that do it and suffer it, a brand to the end of the world. This is clean, Cam. Merely awry. When he did love his country, it honoured him. The service of the foot, being once gangrened, is not then respected for what before it was. We'll hear no more. Pursue him to his house and pluck him thence, lest his infection, being of catching nature, spread further. One word more, one word. This tiger-footed rage, when it shall find the harm of unscanned swiftness, will too late tie leaden pounds to his heels. Proceed by process, lest parties, as he is beloved, break out, and sack great Rome with Romans. If it were so. What do ye talk? Have we not had a taste of his obedience? Are Edal smote, ourselves resisted? Come. Consider this. He has been bred i' the wars since he could draw a sword, and is ill-schooled in bolted language. Meal and bran together he throws without distinction. Give me leave, I'll go to him, and undertake to bring him where he shall answer, by a lawful form, in peace, to his utmost peril. Noble tribunes, it is the humane way. The other course will prove too bloody, and the end of it unknown to the beginning. Noble Meninius, be you then as the people's officer. Masters, lay down your weapons. Go not home. Meet on the market-place. We'll attend you there where, if you bring not Coriolanus, we'll proceed in our first way. I'll bring him to you. To the senators. Let me desire your company. He must come, or what is worst will follow. Pray you let's to him. Exeunt. Scene two. A room in Coriolanus's house. Enter Coriolanus with patricians. Let them puff all about mine ears. Present me death on the wheel, or at wild horses' heels, or pile ten hills on the Tarpeian rock, that the precipitation might downstretch below the beam of sight, yet will I still be thus to them. You do the nobler. I muse my mother does not approve me further, who was wont to call them woollen vassals, things created to buy and sell with groats, to show bare heads in congregations, to yawn, be still, and wander, when one but of my ordinance stood up to speak of peace or war. Enter Volumnia. I talk of you. Why did you wish me milder? Would you have me false to my nature? Rather say I play the man I am. 
Oh, sir, 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 I would have had you put your power well on before you had worn it out. Let go. You might have been enough the man you are with striving less to be so. Lesser had been the thwartings of your dispositions if you had not showed them how you were disposed ere they lacked power to cross you. Let them hang. Ay, and burn too. Enter Menenius and Senators. Come, come, you have been too rough, something too rough. You must return and mend it. There's no remedy, unless by not so doing our good city cleave in the midst and perish. Pray, be counselled. I have a heart as little apt as yours, but yet a brain that leads my use of anger to better vantage. Well said, noble woman. Before he should thus stoop to the herd, but that the violent fit of the time craves it as physic for the whole state, I would put mine armour on, which I can scarcely bear. What must I do? Return to the tribunes. Well, what then? What then? Repent what you have spoke. For then, I cannot do it to the gods. Must I then do it to them? You are too absolute, though therein you never can be too noble, but when extremities speak. I have heard you say, honour and policy, like unsevered friends, i' the war do grow together. Grant that, and tell me in peace what each of them by the other lose, that they combine not there. Tush, tush. A good demand. If it be honour in your wars to seem the same you are not, which for your best ends you adopt your policy, how is it less or worse that it shall hold companionship in peace with honour, as in war, since that to both it stands in like request? Why force you this? Because that now it lies you on to speak to the people, not by your own instruction, nor by the matter which your heart prompts you, but with such words that are but rooted in your tongue, though but bastards and syllables of no allowance to your bosom's truth. Now this no more dishonours you at all than to take in a town with gentle words, which else would put you to your fortune and the hazard of much blood. I would dissemble with my nature where my fortunes and my friends at stake required I should do so in honour. I am in this your wife, your son, these senators, the nobles, and you will rather show our general louts how you can frown than spend a fawn upon them for the inheritance of their loves and safeguard of what that want might ruin. Noble lady, come, go with us, speak fair, you may salve so, not what is dangerous present, but the loss of what is past. I prithee now, my son. Go to them, with this bonnet in thy hand, and thus far having stretched it, here be with them, thy knee bussing the stones, for in such business action is eloquence, and the eyes of the ignorant more learned than the ears, waving thy head, which often thus correcting thy stout heart, now humble as the ripest mulberry that will not hold the handling, or say to them, Thou art their soldier, and being bred in broils hast not the soft way which, thou dost confess, were fit for thee to use as they do claim, in asking their good loves. But thou wilt frame thyself, forsooth, hereafter theirs, so far as thou hast power and person. This but done, even as she speaks, why, their hearts were yours, for they have pardons being asked as free as words to little purpose. Prithee now, go and be ruled, although I know thou hadst rather follow thine enemy in a fiery gulf than flatter him in a bower. Here is Cominius. Enter Cominius. I have been in the market-place, and, sir, tis fit you make strong party, or defend yourself by calmness or by absence. All's in anger. Only fair speech. I think twill serve if he can thereto frame his spirit. He must and will. Prithee now, say you will, and go about it. Must I go show them my unbarbed sconce? Must I with base tongue give my noble heart a lie that it must bear? Well, I will do it. Yet were there but this single plot to lose, this mould of Martius, 
they to dust should grind it and throw it against the wind to the market-place you have put me now to such a part which never i shall discharge to the life come come we'll prompt you i prithee now sweet son as thou hast said my praises made thee first a soldier so to have my praise for this perform a part thou hast not done before well i must do it away my disposition and possess me some harlot's spirit my throat of war be turned which quired with my drum into a pipe small as an eunuch or the virgin voice that babies lulls asleep the smiles of knaves tent in my cheeks and schoolboys tears take up the glasses of my sight a beggar's tongue make motion through my lips and my armed knees who bowed but in my stirrup bend like his that hath received an arms i will not do it lest i cease to honour mine own truth and by my body's action teach my mind a most inherent baseness at thy choice then to beg of thee it is my more dishonour than thou of them come all to ruin let thy mother rather feel thy pride than fear thy dangerous stoutness, for I mark at death with as big heart as thou. Do as thou list, thy valiantness was mine, thou suck'st it from me. But, O oh, thy pride, thyself! Pray be content, mother. I am going to the market-place. Chide me no more. I'll mountebank their loves, cog their hearts from them, and come home beloved of all the trades in Rome. Look, I am going. Commend me to my wife, I'll return consul, or never trust to what my tongue can do with the way of flattery further. Do your will. Exit. Away! The tribunes do attend you. Arm yourself to answer mildly. For they are prepared with accusations, as I hear, more strong than are upon you yet. The word is mildly. Pray you, let us go. Let them accuse me by invention. I will answer in mine honour. Ah, but mildly. Well, mildly be it then, mildly. Exeunt. Scene three. The same. The forum. Enter Sicinius and Brutus. In this point charge him home, that he affects tyrannical power. If he evade us there, enforce him with his envy to the people, and that the spoil got on the Antiates was ne'er distributed. Enter an Edile. What, will he come? He's coming. How accompanied? With old Meninius and those senators that always favored him. Have you a catalogue of all the voices that we have procured set down by the poll? I have, tis ready. Have you collected them by tribes? I have. Assemble presently the people hither, and when they bear me say, it shall be so i' the right and strength o' the commons, be it either for death, for fine, or banishment, then let them, if I say fine, cry fine, if death, cry death insisting on the old prerogative and power i the truth o the cause i shall inform them and when such time they have begun to cry let them not cease but with a din confused enforce the present execution of what we chance to sentence very well make them be strong and ready for this hint when we shall hap to give to them go about it exit a delay Put him to collar straight. He hath been used ever to conquer, and to have his worth of contradiction. Being once chafed, he cannot be reined again to temperance. Then he speaks what's in his heart, and that is there which looks with us to break his neck. Well, here he comes. Enter Coriolanus, Menenius, and Cominius, with senators and patricians. Calmly, I do beseech you. I, as an ostler, that for the poorest peace will bear the knave by the volume. The honoured gods keep Rome in safety, and the chairs of justice supplied with worthy men. Plant love among us, throng our large temples with the shows of peace, 
and not our streets with war. Amen. Amen. A noble wish. Re-enter Idle with citizens. Draw near, ye people. List to your tribunes, audience, peace, I say. First, hear me speak. Well, say. Peace, ho! Shall I be charged no further than this present? Must all determine here? I do demand, if you submit you to the people's voices, allow their officers and are content to suffer lawful censure for such faults as shall be proven upon you. I am content. Lo, citizens, he says he is content, the warlike service he has done, consider, think upon the wounds his body bears, which show like graves in the holy churchyard. Scratches with briars, scars to move laughter only. Consider further that when he speaks, not like a citizen, you'll find him like a soldier. Do not take his rougher accents for malicious sounds, but, as I say, such as become a soldier, rather than envy you. Well, well, no more. What is the matter that being passed for consul with full voice, I am so dishonoured that the very hour you take it off again? Answer to us. Say then, tis true, I ought so. We charge you, that you have contrived to take from Rome all seasoned office and to wind yourself into a power tyrannical, for which you are a traitor to the people. How? Traitor! Nay, temperately, your promise. The fires in the lowest hell fold in the people. Call me their traitor, thou injurious tribune. Within thine eyes sat twenty thousand deaths, in thy hand clutched as many millions, in thy lying tongue both numbers. I would say thou liest unto thee with a voice as free as I do pray the gods. Mark you this, people? To the rock! To the rock! To the rock! Peace. We need not put new matter to his charge. What you have seen him do and heard him speak, beating your officers, cursing yourselves, opposing laws with strokes, and here defying those whose great power must try him. Even this, so criminal and in such capital kind, deserves the extremest death. But since he hath served well for Rome, what do you prate of service? I talk of that that know it. You? Is this the promise that you made your mother? No, I pray you. I know no further. Let them pronounce the steep tarpeian death, vagabond exile, flaying, pent to linger but with a grain a day. I would not buy their mercy at the price of one fair word nor check my courage for what they can give, to have it with saying, Good morrow. For that he has, as much as in him lies, from time to time envied against the people, seeking means to pluck away their power, as now at last given hostile strokes, and that not in the presence of dreaded justice, but on the ministers that do distribute it. In the name of the people and in the power of us the tribunes, we, even from this instant, Banish him our city, in peril of precipitation from off the rock Tarpeian never more to enter our Rome gates. I the people's name, I say it shall be so. It shall be so, it shall be so. Let him away, he's banished, and it shall be so. Hear me, my masters and my common friends. He sentenced. No more hearing. Let me speak. I have been counsel and can show for Rome her enemies' marks upon me. I do love my country's good with a respect more tender, more holy and profound, than mine own life, my dear wife's estimate, her womb's increase, and treasure of my loins. Then if I would speak that— We know your drift. Speak what? There's no more to be said, but he is banished as enemy to the people and his country. It shall be so. It, it shall, shall be so. so. It it shall shall be so. so. You common cry of curs, whose breath I hate as reek of the rotten fens, whose loves I prize as the dead carcasses of unburied men that do corrupt my air, I banish you. And here remain with your uncertainty. Let every feeble rumour shake your hearts. 
your enemies with nodding of their plumes fan you into despair have the power still to banish your defenders till at length your ignorance which finds not till it feels making not reservation of yourselves still your own foes deliver you as most abated captives to some nation that won you without blows despising for you the city thus i turn my back there is a world elsewhere exeunt coriolanus comenius meninius senators and patricians the people's enemy is gone is gone our enemy is banished he is gone banished shouting and throwing up their caps go see him out at gates and follow him as he hath followed you with all despite give him deserved vexation let a guard attend us through the city come come let's see him out the gates come the gods preserve our noble tribunes come Exeunt. End of Act 3. Act 4 of Coriolanus by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 4, Scene 1 rome before a gate of the city enter coriolanus volumnia virgilia meninius comenius with the young nobility of rome come leave your tears a brief farewell the beast with many heads butts me away nay mother where is your ancient courage you were used to say extremity was the trier of spirits that common chances common men could bear, that when the sea was calm, all boats alike showed mastership in floating, fortune's blows when most struck home, being gentle wounded, craves a noble cunning. You were used to load me with precepts that would make invincible the heart that conned them. O oh, heavens, O oh, heavens! Nay, prithee woman. Now the red pestilence strike all trades in Rome, and occupations perish. What, what, what? I shall be loved when I am lacked. Nay, mother, resume that spirit when you were wont to say, if you had been the wife of Hercules, six of his labours you'd have done, and saved your husband so much sweat. Herminius, droop not. Adieu. Farewell, my wife, my mother. I'll do well yet. Thou old and true Meninius, thy tears are salter than a younger man's, and venomous to thine eyes. My sometime general, I have seen thee stem, and thou hast oft beheld heart-hardening spectacles. Tell these sad women tis fond to wail inevitable strokes, as tis to laugh at em. My mother, you wot well my hazards still have been your solace, and believe it not lightly, though I go alone, like to a lonely dragon, that his fen makes feared and talked of more than seen, your son will, or exceed the common, or be caught with cautelous baits and practice. My first son, whither wilt thou go? Take good Cominius with thee a while, determine on some course, more than a wild exposture to each chance that starts the way before thee. Oh, the gods! I'll follow thee a month, devise with thee where thou shalt rest, that thou mayst hear of us as we of thee. For if the time thrust forth a cause for thy repeal, we shall not send o'er the vast world to seek a single man, and lose advantage, which doth ever cool the absence of the needer. Fare ye well. Thou hast years upon thee, and thou art too full of the war's surfeits to go rove with one that's yet unbruised. Bring me but out at gate. Come, my sweet wife. 
my dearest mother, and my friends of noble touch. When I am forth, bid me farewell and smile. I pray you, come. While I remain above the ground, you shall hear from me still, and never of me aught but what is like me formerly. That's worthily as any ear can hear. Come, let's not weep. If I could shake off but one seven years from these old arms and legs, by the good gods, I'll with thee every foot. Give me thy hand. Come. Exeunt. Scene two. The same. A street near the gate. Enter Cecinius, Brutus, and an Edile. Bid them all home. He's gone, and we'll no further. The nobility are vexed, whom we see have cited in his behalf. Now we have shown our power. Let us seem humbler after it is done than when it was a doing. Bid them home. Say their great enemy is gone, and they stand in their ancient strength. Dismiss them home. Exit a delay. Here comes his mother. Let's not meet her. Why? They say she's mad. They have taken note of us. Keep on your way. Enter Volumnia, Virgilia, and Meninius. Ho, oh, you are well met. The hoarded plague of the gods requites your love. Peace, peace, be not so loud. If that I could for weeping you should hear. Nay, and you shall hear some. To Brutus. Will you be gone? To Sassanius. You shall stay too. I would I had the power to say so to my husband. Are you mankind? Ay, fool, is that a shame? Note but this fool. Was not a man my father? Hadst thou fox-ship to banish him that struck more blows for Rome than thou hast spoken words? O blessed heavens! More noble blows than ever thou, wise words, and for Rome's good. I'll tell thee what. Oh, yet go. Nay, but thou shalt stay too. I would my son were in Arabia, and thy tribe before him, his good sword in his hand. What then? What then? He'll make an end of thy posterity. Bastards and all. Good man, the wounds that he does bear for Rome. Come, come, peace. I would he had continued to his country as he began, and not unknit himself from the noble knot he made. I would he had. I would he had. Twas you incensed the rabble. Cats that can judge as fitly of his worth as I can of those mysteries which heaven will not have earth to know. Pray let us go. Now pray, sir, get you gone. You have done a brave deed. Ere you go, hear this. As far as doth the capital exceed the meanest house in Rome, so far my son, this lady's husband here, this, do you see, whom you have banished, does exceed you all. Well, well, we'll leave you. Why stay we to be baited with one who wants her wits? Take my prayers with you. Exeunt Tribunes I would the gods had nothing else to do but to confirm my curses. Could I meet him but once a day, it would unclog my heart of what lies heavy to it. You have told them home, and by my truth you have cause. You'll sup with me? Anger's my meat. I sup upon myself, and so shall starve with feeding. Come, let's go. Leave this faint puling and lament as I do, in anger, Juno-like. Come! Come, come! Fie, fie, fie! Exeunt. Scene three. A highway between Rome and Antium. Enter a Roman and a Wolsey meeting. I know you well, sir, and you know me. Your name, I think, is Adrian. It is so, sir. Truly, I have forgot you. I am a Roman, and my services are, as you are, against them. Know you me yet? Nicano? No. The same, sir. You had more beard when I last saw you, but your favor is well approved by your tongue. What's the news in Rome? I have a note from the Volsian state to find you out there. You have well saved me a day's journey. There have been in Rome strange insurrections. The people against the senators, patricians, and nobles. Hath been? Is it ended then? Our state thinks not so. They are in a most warlike preparation, and hope to come upon them in the heat of their division. 
the main blaze of it is past, but a small thing would make it flame again, for the nobles receive so to heart the banishment of that worthy Coriolanus, that they are in ripe aptness to take all power from the people, and to pluck from them their tribunes for ever. This lies glowing, I can tell you, and is almost mature for the violent breaking out. Coriolanus banished? Banished, sir. You will be welcome with this intelligence, Nicanor. The day serves well for them now. I have heard it said, the fittest time to corrupt a man's wife is when she's fallen out with her husband. Your noble Tullus Aphidius will appear well in these wars. His great opposer, Coriolanus, being now in no request of his country. He cannot choose. I am most fortunate thus accidentally to encounter you, you have ended my business, and I will merely accompany you home. I shall, between this and supper, tell you most strained things from Rome, all tending to the good of their adversaries. Have you an army ready, say you? A most royal one. The centurions and their charges, distinct abilities, already in the entertainment, and to be on foot at an hour's warning. I am joyful to hear of their readiness and am the man, I think, that shall set him in present action. So, sir, heartily well met, and most glad of your company. You take my part from me, sir. I have the most cause to be glad of yours. Well, let us go together. Exeunt. Scene 4. Antium. Before Aphidius's house. Enter Coriolanus in mean apparel, disguised and muffled. A goodly city is this Antium. City, tis I that made thy widows. Many an air of these fair edifices for my wars have I heard groan and drop. Then know me not, lest that thy wives with spits and boys with stones in puny battles slay me. Enter a citizen. Save you, sir. And you. Direct me, if it be your will, where great Ophidius lies. Is he in Antium? He is, and feasts the nobles of the state at his house this night. Which is his house, beseech you? This, here before you. Thank you, sir. Farewell. Exit, citizen. O oh, world, thy slippery turns. Friends now fast sworn, whose double bosoms seem to wear one heart, whose house, whose bed, whose meal, and exercise are still together, who twin as twere in love unseparable, shall within this hour, on a dissension of a doit, break out to bitterest enmity, so fellest foes, whose passions and whose plots have broke their sleep, to take the one the other, by some chance, some trick not worth an egg, shall grow dear friends and interjoin their issues. So with me, my birthplace hate I, and my love's upon this enemy town. I'll enter, if he slay me he does fair justice, if he give me way, I'll do his country service. Exit. Scene 5. The same. A hall in Aphidius's house. Music within. Enter a serving man. Wine, 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 what service is here? I think our fellows are asleep. Exit. Enter a second serving man. Where's Codus? My master calls for him. Codus! Exit. Enter Coriolanus. A goodly house. The feast smells well. But I appear not like a guest. Re-enter the first serving man. What would you have, friend? Whence are you? Is no place for you. Pray go to the door. Exit. I have deserved no better entertainment in being Coriolanus. Re-enter second serving man. Whence are you, sir? Has the porter his eyes in his head? Then he gets entrance to such companions? Pray get you out. Away. Away. Get you away. Now thou art troublesome. Are you so brave? I'll have you talked with anon. Enter a third serving man. The first meets him. What fellow's this? A strange one as ever I looked on. 
I cannot get him out of the house. Prithee, call my master to him. Retires. What have you to do here, fellow? Pray you avoid the house. Let me but stand. I will not hurt your hearth. What are you? A gentleman. Marvellous poor one. True, so I am. Pray you, poor gentleman, take up some other station. Here's no place for you. Pray you avoid. Come. Follow your function. Go and batten on cold bits. Pushes him away. What? You will not? Prithee, tell my master what a strange guest he has here. And I shall. Exit. Where dwellest thou? Under the canopy. Under the canopy? Aye. Where's that? In the city of kites and crows. In the city of kites and crows? What an ass it is! Then thou dwellest with doors too. No, I serve not thy master. How, sir? Do you meddle with my master? Ay, tis an honester service than to meddle with thy mistress, thou pratest and pratest. Serve with thy trencher, hence! Beats him away. Exit third serving man. Enter Phidias with the second serving man. Where is this fellow? Here, sir. I'd have beaten him like a dog, but for disturbing the lords within. Retires. Whence comest thou? What wouldst thou? Thy name? Why speaks not? Speak, man, what's thy name? Unmuffling. If, Tullus, not yet thou knowest me, and, seeing me, dost not think me for the man I am, necessity commands me name myself. What is thy name? A name unmusical to the Balsian's ears, and harsh in sound to thine. Say, what's thy name? Thou hast a grim appearance, and thy face bears a command in it, Though thy tackle's torn, thou showest a noble vessel. What's thy name? Prepare thy brow to frown. Knowst thou me yet? I know thee not. Thy name? My name is Caius Martius, who hath done to thee particularly, and to all the Volsies, great hurt and mischief. Thereto witness may my surname, Coriolanus, the painful service, the extreme dangers and the drops of blood shed for my thankless country are requited but with that surname a good memory and witness of the malice and displeasure which thou shouldst bear me only that name remains the cruelty and envy of the people permitted by our dastard nobles who have all forsook me hath devoured the rest and suffered me by the voice of slaves to be whooped out of Rome. Now this extremity hath brought me to thy hearth, not out of hope, mistake me not, to save my life, for if I had feared death, of all the men in the world I would have voided thee, but in mere spite, to be full quit of those my banishers, stand I before thee here. Then, if thou hast a heart of reek in thee, that wilt revenge thine own particular wrongs, and stop those names of shame seen through thy country, speed thee straight, and make my misery serve thy turn. So use it, that my revengeful services may prove as benefits to thee, for I will fight against my cankered country with the spleen of all the under fiends. But if so be, thou darest not this, and that to prove more fortunes thou art tired, then, in a word, I also am longer to live most weary, and present my throat to thee and to thy ancient malice, which not to cut would show thee but a fool, since I have ever followed thee with hate, drawn tons of blood out of thy country's breast, and cannot live but to thy shame, unless it be to do thee service. O oh, Martius! Martius, each word thou hast spoke hath weeded from my heart a root of ancient envy. If Jupiter should from yon cloud speak divine things and say tis true, I'll not believe them more than thee, all noble Coriolanus. Let me twine mine arms about that body, where against my grained ash an hundred times hath broke and scarred the moon with splinters. 
Here I clip the anvil of my sword, and do contest as hotly and as nobly with thy love as ever in ambitious strength I did contend against thy valour. Know thou first, I loved the maid I married, never man sighed truer breath, but that I see thee here, thou noble thing, more dances my rapt heart than when I first my wedded mistress saw bestride my threshold. Why, thou Mars! I tell thee we have a power on foot, and I had purpose once more to hew thy target from thy brawn or lose mine arm for it. Thou hast beat me out twelve several times, and I have nightly since dreamt of encounters twixt thyself and me. We have been down together in my sleep, unbuckling helms, fisting each other's throat, and waked half dead with nothing. Worthy Martius, had we no quarrel else to Rome, but that thou art thence banished, we would muster all from twelve to seventy, and pouring war into the bowels of ungrateful Rome like a bold flood or bear. O oh, come, go in, and take our friendly senators by the hands who now are here, taking their leaves of me who am prepared against your territories, though not for Rome itself. You bless me, gods. Therefore, most absolute sir, if thou wilt have the leading of thine own revenges, take the one half of my commission, and set down, as best thou art experienced, since thou knowest thy country's strength and weakness, thine own ways, whether to knock against the gates of Rome or rudely visit them in parts remote, to fright them ere destroy. But come in. Let me commend thee first to those that shall say yea to thy desires a thousand welcomes, and more a friend than e'er an enemy. Yet, Martius, that was much. Your hand, most welcome. Exeunt Coriolanus and Ophidius. The two serving men come forward. Here's a strange alteration. By my hand. I had thought to have struck him with a cudgel. And yet my mind gave me his clothes made a false report of him. What an arm he has! He turned me about with his finger and his thumb, as one would set up a top. Nay, I knew by his face that there was something in him. He had, sir, a kind of face, methought. I cannot tell how to term it. He had so, looking as it were. Would I were hanged, but I thought there was more in him than I could think. So did I, I'll be sworn. He is simply the rarest man in the world. I think he is. But a greater soldier than he you wot on. Who? My master? Nay, it's no matter for that. Worth six on him. Nay, not so neither. But I'd take him to be the greater soldier. Faith, look you, one cannot tell how to say that. For the defence of a town, our general is excellent. Aye, and for an assault, too. Re-enter a third serving man. Ho, oh, slaves, I can tell you news. News, you rascals! What, 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 let's partake. I would not be a Roman of all nations. I had as leave be a condemned man. Wherefore, wherefore? Wherefore? Why, here's he that was wont to thwack our general, Caius Coriolanus. Why do you say thwack our general? I do not say thwack our general, but he was always good enough for him. Come, we are fellows and friends. He was ever too hard for him. I have heard him say so himself. He was too hard for him directly to say the troth on it. Before Corioli he scorched him and notched him like a carbonado. And he had been cannibally given. He might have broiled and eaten him too. But more of thy news. Why, he is so made on here within as if he was son and heir to Mars, set at upper end of the table. No question asked of him by any of the senators, but they stand bald before him sanctifies himself with his hands and turns up the white of the eye to his discourse but the bottom of the news is that our general is cut i the middle and but one half of what he was yesterday for the other as half by the entreaty and grant of the whole table he'll go he says and sow the porter o rome's gates by the ears he will mow all down before him and leave his passage polled and he's as like to do it as any man i can imagine do it he will do it, for look you, sir, he has as many friends as enemies, which friends, sir, as it were, durst not, look you, sir, show themselves, as we term it, as friends, while he's in directitude. Directitude? 
attitude what's that but when they shall see sir is crest up again and the man in blood they will out of their burrows like conies after rain and revel all with him but when goes this forward to-morrow to-day presently you shall have the drum struck up this afternoon tis as it were a parcel of their feast and to be executed ere they wipe their lips why then we shall have a stern world again this piece is nothing but to rust iron increase tailors and breed ballad makers let me have war say i it exceeds peace as far as day does night it's sprightly waking audible and full of vent peace is a very apoplexy lethargy mould deaf sleepy insensible a getter of more bastard children than war's a destroyer of men tis so and as war in some sort may be said to be a ravisher so it cannot be denied but peace is a great maker of cuckolds ay and it makes men hate one another reason because they then less need one another the war's for my money i hope to see romans as cheap as volsians they are rising they are rising in 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 in, 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 in. Exeunt. Scene six. Rome, a public place. Enter Cecinius and Brutus. We hear not of him, neither need we fear him. His remedies are tame in the present peace and quietness of the people, which before were in wild hurry. Here do we make his friends blush that the world goes well, who rather had, though they themselves did suffer bite behold dissentious numbers pestering the streets than see our tradesmen within their shops and going about their functions friendly we stood to it in good time enter meninius is this meninius tis he tis he oh he is grown most kind of late hail, hail sir. sir hail to you both your coriolanus is not much missed but with his friends the commonwealth doth stand and so would do were he more angry at it all's well and might have been much better if he could have temporized where is he hear you nay i hear nothing his mother and his wife hear nothing from him enter three or four citizens the gods preserve you both god den our neighbours god den to you all god den to you all ourselves our wives and children on our knees are bound to pray for you both live and thrive farewell kind neighbours we wished coriolanus had loved you as we did now the gods keep you farewell farewell exeunt citizens this is a happier and more comely time than when these fellows ran about the streets crying confusion caius coriolanus was a worthy officer in the war but insolent all come with pride ambitious past all thinking self-loving and affecting one sole throne without assistance i think not so we should by this to all our lamentation if he had gone forth counsel found it so the gods have well prevented it and rome sits safe and still without him enter an edile worthy tribunes there is a slave whom we have put in prison reports the volskis with two several powers are entered in the roman territories and with the deepest malice of the war destroy what lies before them tis ophidius who hearing of our coriolanus banishment thrusts forth his horns again into the world which were in shell when coriolanus stood for rome and durst not once peep out come what talk of you of coriolanus go see this rumourer whipped it cannot be the volskis dare break with us cannot be we have record that very well it can and three examples of the like have been within my age but reason with the fellow before you punish him where he has heard this lest you shall chance to whip your information and beat the messenger who bids beware of what is to be dreaded tell not me i know this cannot be not possible enter a messenger the nobles in great earnestness are going all to the senate house some news is come that turns their countenances tis this slave go whip him for the people's eyes his raising nothing but his report yes worthy sir the slave's report is seconded and more more fearful is delivered what more fearful 
it is spoke freely out of many mouths, how probable I do not know, that Coriolanus joined with the Phidias leads a power against Rome, and vows revenge as spacious as between the youngest and oldest thing. This is most likely. Raised only that the weaker sort may wish good Coriolanus home again. The very trick on't. This is unlikely. He and Ophidius can no more atone than violentest contrariety. Enter a second messenger. You are sent for to the Senate. A fearful army led by Caius Coriolanus associated with Ophidius rages upon our territories, and have already all borne their way, consumed with fire, and took what lay before them. Enter Comenius. Oh, you have made good work. What news? What news? You have halp to ravish your own daughters, and to melt the city leads upon your pates, to see your wives dishonoured to your noses. What's the news? What's the news? Your temples burned in their cement, and your franchises whereon you stood confined into an augur's bore. Pray now your news. You have made fair work, I fear me. Pray your news. If Coriolanus should be joined with Volscians— If! He is their god. He leads them like a thing made by some other deity than nature, that shapes man better, and they follow him against us brats, with no less confidence than boys pursuing summer butterflies or butchers killing flies. You have made good work, you and your apron men, you that stood so up much on the voice of occupation and the breath of garlic eaters. He will shake your Rome about your ears. As Hercules did shake down mellow fruit, you have made fair work. But is this true, sir? Ay, and you'll look pale before you find it other. All the regions do smilingly revolt, and who resist are mocked for valiant ignorance, and perish constant fools. Who is't can blame him? Your enemies and his find something in him. We're all undone, unless the noble man have mercy. Who shall ask it? The tribunes cannot do it for shame. The people deserve such pity of him as the wolf does of the shepherds. For his best friends, if they should say, Be good to Rome, they charged him even as those should that had deserved his hate, and therein showed like enemies. Tis true. If he were putting to my house the brand that should consume it, I have not the face to say, Beseech you, cease. You have made fair hands. You and your crafts, you have crafted fair. You have brought a trembling upon Rome, such as was never so incapable of help. Say not we brought it. How? Was it we? We loved him but like beasts and cowardly nobles, gave way unto your clusters who did hoot him out of the city. But I fear they'll roar in him again. Tullus Ophidius, the second name of men, obeys his points as if he were his officer. Desperation is all the policy, strength, and defense that Rome can make against them. Enter a troop of citizens. Here come the clusters. And is Ophidius with him? You are they that made the air unwholesome when you cast your stinking, greasy caps in hooting at Coriolanus's exile? Now he's coming, and not a hair upon a soldier's head, which will not prove a whip. As many coxcombs as you threw caps up will he tumble down and pay you for your voices. Tis no matter, if he could burn us all into one coal, we have deserved it. Faith, we hear fearful news. For mine own part, when I said banish him, I said twas pity. And so did I. And so did I. And to say the truth, so did very many of us. That we did, we did for the best. And though we willingly consented to his banishment, yet it was against our will. Ye are goodly things, you voices. You have made good work, you and your cry. Shells to the Capitol? Oh, aye, what else? Exeunt Comenius and Meninius. Go, masters, get you home. Be not dismayed. These are a side that would be glad to have this true which they so seem to fear. Go home, and show no sign of fear. The gods be good to us. Come, masters, let's home. I ever said we were in the wrong when we banished him. So did we all. But come, let's home. 
Axion citizens. I do not like this news. Nor I. Let's to the capital. Would half my wealth would buy this for a lie. Pray, let us go. Exeunt. Scene 7. A camp, at a small distance from Rome. Enter Ophidius and his lieutenant. Do they still fly to the Roman? I do not know what witchcraft's in him, but your soldiers use him as the grace for meat, their talk at the table, and their thanks at end. And you are darkened in this action, sir, even by your own. I cannot help it now, unless by using means I lame the foot of our design. He bears himself more proudlier even to my person than I thought he would when first I did embrace him. Yet his nature in that's no changeling, and I must excuse what cannot be amended. Yet I wish, sir, uh, I mean for your particular, you had not joined in commission with him, but either had borne the action of yourself, or else to him had left it solely. I understand thee well, and be thou sure when he shall come to his account he knows not what I can urge against him. Although it seems, and so he thinks, and is no less apparent to the vulgar eye, that he bears all things fairly, and shows good husbandry for the Volscian state, fights dragon-like, and does achieve as soon as draw his sword, yet he hath left undone that which shall break his neck or hazard mine, when e'er we come to our account. Sir, I beseech you, think you he'll carry Rome? All places yield to him ere he sits down, and the nobility of Rome are his. The senators and patricians love him too. The tribunes are no soldiers, and their people will be as rash in the repeal as hasty to expel him thence. I think he'll be to Rome as is the osprey to the fish, who takes it by sovereignty of nature. First he was a noble servant to them, but he could not carry his honours even. Whether twas pride, which out of daily fortune ever taints the happy man, whether defect of judgment, to fail in the disposing of those chances which he was lord of, or whether nature, not to be other than one thing, not moving from the cask to the cushion, but commanding peace even with the same austerity and garb as he controlled the war, but one of these, as he hath spices of them all, not all, for I dare so far free him, made him feared, so hated, and so banished, but he has a merit to choke it in the utterance. So our virtues lie in the interpretation of the time, and power, unto itself most commendable, hath not a tomb so evident as a chair to extol what it hath done. One fire drives out one fire, one nail, one nail. Rights by rights falter, strengths by strengths do fail. Come, let's away. When, Caius, Rome is thine, thou art poorest of all, then shortly art thou mine. Exeunt. End of Act 4 Act 5 of Coriolanus by William Shakespeare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 5, Scene 1 Rome a public place. Enter Menenius, Cominius, Sicinius, Brutus, and others. No, I'll not go. You hear what he hath said, which was sometime his general, who loved him in a most dear particular. He called me father, but what of that? Go, you that banished him, a mile before his tent fall down, and knee the way into his mercy. Nay, if he coyed to hear Cominius speak, I'll keep it home. He would not seem to know me. Do you hear? Yet one time he did call me by my name. I urged our old acquaintance, and the drops that we have bled together. Coriolanus he would not answer to, forbade all names. He was a kind of nothing, titleless, till he had forged himself a name of the fire of burning Rome. Why so? You have made good work. A pair of tribunes that have wrecked for Rome to make coals cheap. A noble memory. I minded him how royal twas to pardon when it was less expected. He replied, It was a bare petition of a state to one whom they had punished. Very well. Could he say less? I offered to awaken his regard for his private friends. 
His answer to me was, he could not stay to pick them in a pile of noisome musty chaff. He said twas folly for one poor grain or two to leave unburnt and still to nose the offence. One poor grain or two, I am one of those. His mother, wife, his child, and this brave fellow too, we are the grains, you are the musty chaff, and you are smelt above the moon. We must be burnt for you. Nay, pray, be patient. If you refuse your aid in this so never needed help, yet do not upbraids with our distress. But, sure, if you would be your country's pleader, your good tongue, more than the instant army we can make, might stop our countrymen. No, I'll not meddle. Pray you, go to him. What should I do? Only make trial what your love can do for Rome towards Coriolanus. Well, and say that Coriolanus return me, as Cominius is returned, unheard? What then? But as a discontented friend, grief-shot with his unkindness, say it be so? Yet your good will must have that thanks from Rome, after the measure as you intended well. I'll undertake it. I think he'll hear me. Yet to bite his lip and hum at good Cominius much unhearts me. He was not taken well, he had not dined, the veins unfilled, our blood is cold, and then we pout upon the morning, are unapt to give or to forgive. But when we have stuffed these and these conveyances of our blood with wine and feeding, we have suppler souls than in our priest-like fasts. Therefore I'll watch him till he be dieted to my request and then I'll set upon him. You know the very road into his kindness, and cannot lose your way. Good faith, I'll prove him. Speed how it will, I shall ere long have knowledge of my success. Exit. He'll never hear him. Not? I tell you, he does sit in gold, his eye red as t'would burn Rome, and his injury the jailer to his pity. I kneeled before him, "'Twas very faintly, he said, rise. "'Dismissed me thus with his speechless hand. "'What he would do he sent in writing after me, "'but he would not, bound with an oath to yield to his conditions, "'so that all hope is vain, "'unless his noble mother and his wife, "'who, as I hear, mean to solicit him for mercy to his country. "'Therefore let's hence, and with our fair entreaties, haste them on. Exeunt. Scene two. Entrance of the Volsian camp before Rome. Two sentinels on guard. Enter to them Meninius. Stay, whence are you? Stand, and go back. You guard like men, tis well. But by your leave, I am an officer of state, and come to speak with Coriolanus. From whence? From Rome. You may not pass, you must return. Our general will no more hear from thence. You'll see your Rome embraced with fire before you'll speak with Coriolanus. Good, my friends, if you have heard your general talk of Rome, and of his friends there, it is lots to blanks. My name hath touched your ears. It is Menenius. Be it so, go back. The virtue of your name is not here passable. I tell thee, fellow, the general is my lover. I have been the book of his good acts, whence men have read his name unparalleled haply amplified, for I have ever verified my friends, of whom he's chief, with all the sighs that verity would without lapsing suffer. Nay, sometimes, like to a bowl upon a subtle ground, I have tumbled past the throw, and in his praise have almost stamped the leasing. Therefore, fellow, I must have leave to pass. Faith, sir, if you had told as many lies in his behalf as you have uttered words in your own, you should not pass here, no, though it were as virtuous to lie as to live chastely. Therefore go back. Prithee, fellow, remember my name is Menenius, always factionary to the party of your general. Howsoever you have been his liar, as you say you have, I am one, that telling truth under him, must say, you cannot pass. Therefore go back. Has he dined, canst thou tell? For I would not speak with him till after dinner. You are a Roman, are you? I am, as thy general is. Then you should hate Rome, as he does. 
can you, when you have pushed out your gates, the very defender of them, and in a violent popular ignorance, given your enemy your shield, think to front his revenges with the easy groans of old women, the virginal palms of your daughters, or with the palsied intercession of such a decayed dotant as you seem to be? Can you think to blow out the intended fire your city is ready to flame in, with such weak breath as this? No, you are deceived. Therefore back to Rome, and prepare for your execution. You are condemned. Our general has sworn you out of reprieve and pardon. Sirrah, if thy captain knew I were here, he would use me with estimation. Come, my captain knows you not. I mean thy general. My general cares not for you. Back, I say, go, lest I let forth your half pint of blood. Back. That's the utmost of your having. Back. Nay, but fellow, fellow. Enter Coriolanus and Ophidius. What's the matter? Now, you companion, I'll say an errand for you. You shall know now that I am in estimation. You shall perceive that a jack warden cannot office me from my son Coriolanus. Guess but by my entertainment with him, if thou standest not in the state of hanging, or of some death more long in spectatorship, and crueler in suffering. Behold now presently, and swoon for what's to come upon thee. To Coriolanus. The glorious gods sit in hourly synod about thy particular prosperity, and love thee no worse than thy old father Menenius does. O oh, my son, my son, thou art preparing fire for us. Look thee, here's water to quench it. I was hardly moved to come to thee, but being assured none but myself could move thee, I have been blown out of your gates with sighs, and conjure thee to pardon Rome and thy petitionary countrymen. The good gods assuage thy wrath, and turn the dregs of it upon this varlet here, this who, like a block, hath denied my access to thee. Away. How? Away? Wife, mother, child, I know not. My affairs are servanted to others. Though I owe my revenge properly, my remission lies in Volsian breasts. That we have been familiar in great forgetfulness shall poison rather than pity note how much. Therefore be gone. Mine ears against your suits are stronger than your gates against my force. Yet, for I loved thee, take this along. I writ it for thy sake. Gives a letter and would have rent it. Another word, Menenius, I will not hear thee speak. This man, Ophidius, was my beloved in Rome, yet thou behold'st. You keep a constant temper. Exeunt Coriolanus and Ophidius. Now, sir, is your name Menenius? Tis a spell, you see, of much power. You know the way home again. Did you hear how we are shent for keeping your greatness back? What cause do you think I have to swoon? I neither care for the world nor your general. For such things as you, I can scarce think there's any yet so slight. He that hath a will to die by himself fears it not from another. Let your general do his worst. For you, be that you are, long, and your misery increase with your age. I say to you, as I was said to, away. Exit. A noble fellow, I warrant him. The worthy fellow is our general. He's the rock, the oak not to be when shaken. Exeunt. Scene three. The tent of Coriolanus. Enter Coriolanus, Aphidius, and others. We will before the walls of Rome to-morrow set down our host. My partner in this action, you must report to the Volsian lords how plainly I have borne this business. Only their ends you have respected stopped your ears against the general suit of Rome, never admitted a private whisper, no, not with such friends that thought them sure of you. This last old man, whom with a cracked heart I have sent to Rome, loved me above the measure of a father, nay, godded me indeed. Their latest refuge was to send him, for whose old love I have, though I showed solely to him, once more offered the first conditions which they did refuse and cannot now accept, to grace him only that thought he could do more, a very little I have yielded to, 
fresh embassies and suits, nor from the state, nor private friends, hereafter will I lend ear to. Ha! What shout is this? Shout within. Shall I be tempted to infringe my vow in the same time tis made? I will not. Enter in mourning habits Virgilia, Volumnia, leading young Coriolanus, Valeria, and attendants. My wife comes foremost. Then the honoured mould wherein this trunk was framed, and in her hand the grandchild to her blood. But out affection, all bond and privilege of nature break. Let it be virtuous to be obstinate. What is that curtsy worth, or those dove's eyes which can make gods forsworn? I melt, and am not of stronger earth than others. My mother bows, as if Olympus to a molehill should in supplication nod, and my young boy hath an aspect of intercession, which great nature cries, Deny not. Let the Volsies plough Rome and harrow Italy. I'll never be such a gosling to obey instinct, but stand as if a man were author of himself, and knew no other kin. My lord and husband, these eyes are not the same I wore in Rome. The sorrow that delivers us thus changed makes you think so. Like a dull actor now, I have forgot my part, and I am out, even to a full disgrace. Best of my flesh, forgive my tyranny, but do not say for that forgive our Romans. Oh, a kiss, long as my exile, sweet as my revenge. Now, by the jealous queen of heaven, that kiss I carried from thee, dear, and my true lip hath virgined it e'er since. You gods, I prate, and the most noble mother of the world, leave unsaluted. Sink my knee in the earth. Kneels. Of thy deep duty more impressions show than that of common sons. O oh, stand up blessed! Whilst with no softer cushion than the flint, I kneel before thee, and unproperly show duty, as mistaken all this while between the child and parent. Kneels. What is this? Your knees to me, to your corrected son? Then let the pebbles on the hungry beach fill it the stars. Then let the mutinous wind strike the proud cedars against the fiery sun. Murdering impossibility to make what cannot be slight work. Thou art my warrior. I halt to frame thee. Do you know this lady? The noble sister of Publicola, the moon of Rome, chaste as the icicle that's curdled by the frost from purest snow and hangs on Diane's temple. Dear Valeria, this is a poor epitome of yours which by the interpretation of full time may show like all yourself. The God of soldiers, with the consent of supreme Jove, inform thy thoughts with nobleness, that thou mayest prove to shame unvulnerable, and sticky the wars like a great sea-mark, standing every floor, and saving those that eye thee. Your knee, Sarah. That's my brave boy. Even he, your wife, this lady and myself are suitors to you. I beseech you, peace, or, if you'd ask, remember this before, the thing I have forsworn to grant may never be held by you denials. Do not bid me dismiss my soldiers, or capitulate again with Rome's mechanics. Tell me not wherein I seem unnatural. Desire not to ally my rages and revenges with your colder reasons. Oh, no more, no more. You have said you will not grant us anything, for we have nothing else to ask but that which you deny already. Yet we will ask, that if you fail in our request the blame may hang upon your hardness. Therefore hear us. O Phidias, and you Volsies, mark. For we'll hear naught from Rome in private. Your request? Should we be silent and not speak, Our raiment and state of bodies would bewray What life we have led since thy exile. 
Think with thyself how more unfortunate than all living women are we come hither. Since that thy sight, which should make our eyes flow with joy, hearts dance with comforts, constrains them weep and shake with fear and sorrow, making the mother, wife and child, to see the son, the husband and the father tearing his country's bowels out. And to pour we thine enmities most capital. Thou barst us our prayer to the gods, which is a comfort that all but we enjoy. For how can we, alas, how can we for our country pray? Whereto we are bound, together with thy victory, whereto we are bound? Alack, or we must lose the country, our dear nurse, or else thy person, our comfort in the country. We must find an evident calamity, though we had our wish which side should win. For either thou must as a foreign recreant be led with manacles through our streets, or else triumphantly tread on thy country's ruin, and bear the palm for having bravely shed thy wife and children's blood. For myself, son, I purpose not to wait on fortune till these wars determine. If I cannot persuade thee rather to show a noble grace to both parts than seek the end of one, thou shalt no sooner march to assault thy country than to tread, trust to it thou shalt not, on thy mother's womb that brought thee to this world. I and mine that brought you forth this boy to keep your name living to time. I shall not tread on me. I'll run away till I am bigger, but then I'll fight. Not of a woman's tenderness to be, requires nor child nor woman's face to see. I have sat too long. Rising. Nay, go not from us thus. If it were so that our request did tend to save the Romans, thereby to destroy the Volsces whom you serve, you might condemn us as poisonous of your honour. No, our suit is that you reconcile them. While the Volsces may say, this mercy we have showed, the Romans this we received, and each on either side give the all hail to thee, and cry, Be blessed for making up this peace. Thou knowest, great son, the end of war's uncertain, but this certain, that if thou conquer Rome, the benefit which thou shalt thereby reap is such a name, whose repetition will be dogged with curses, whose chronicle thus writ, the man was noble, but with his last attempt he wiped it out, destroyed his country, and his name remains to the ensuing age aboard. Speak to me, son. Thou hast affected the fine strains of honour to imitate the graces of the gods, to tear with thunder the wide cheeks of the air, and yet to charge thy sulphur with a bolt that should but rive an oak. Why dost not speak? Think'st thou it honourable for a noble man still to remember wrongs? Daughter, speak you. He cares not for your weeping. Speak thou, boy. Perhaps thy childishness will move him more than can our reasons. There's no man in the world more bound to his mother. Yet here he lets me prate like one of the stocks. Thou hast never in thy life showed thy dear mother or any courtesy when she, poor hen, fond of no second brood, has clucked thee to the wars and safely home loaden with honour. Say my requests unjust, and spurn me back. But if it be not so, thou art not honest. And the gods will plague thee, that thou restraint'st from me the duty which to a mother's part belongs. He turns away. Down, ladies, let us shame him with our knees. To his surname Coriolanus longs more pride than pity to our prayers. Down! An end! This is the last. So we will home to Rome, and die among our neighbours. Nay, beholds, this boy that cannot tell what he would have, but kneels and holds up bands for fellowship, does reason our petition with more strength than thou hast to deny it. Come, let us go. This fellow had avulsion to his mother. His wife is in Coriolai, and his child like him by chance. Yet give us our dispatch. I am hushed until our city be afire, and then I'll speak a little. 
He holds her by the hand, silent. Oh, mother, mother, what have you done? Behold, the heavens do ope, the gods look down, and this unnatural scene they laugh at. Oh, my mother, mother, oh, you have won a happy victory to Rome. But for your son, believe it, oh, believe it, most dangerously you have with him prevailed, if not most mortal to him. But let it come. Ophidius, though I cannot make true wars, I'll frame convenient peace. Now, good Ophidius, were you in my stead, would you have heard a mother less, or granted less, Ophidius? I was moved withal. I dare be sworn you were. And, sir, it is no little thing to make mine eyes to sweat compassion. But, good sir, what peace you make, advise me. For my part, I'll not to Rome, I'll back with you. And pray you stand to me in this cause. O oh, mother, wife! Aside. I am glad thou hast set thy mercy and thy honour at difference in thee. Out of that I'll work myself a former fortune. The ladies make signs to Coriolanus. Ay, by and by. To Alumnia, Virgilia, etc. But we will drink together, and you shall bear a better witness back than words, which we, on like conditions, will have countersealed. Come, enter with us. Ladies, you deserve to have a temple built you. All the swords in Italy and her confederate arms could not have made this peace. Exeunt. Scene 4. Rome, a public place. Enter Menenius and Sicinius. See you yon coin of the capital, yon cornerstone? Why, what of that? If it be possible for you to displace it with your little finger, there is some hope the ladies of Rome, especially his mother, may prevail with him. But I say there is no hope in it. Our throats are sentenced, and stay upon execution. Is it possible that so short a time can alter the condition of a man? There is differency between a grub and a butterfly, yet your butterfly was a grub. This Coriolanus is grown from man to dragon. He has wings, he's more than a creeping thing. He loved his mother dearly. So did he me, and he no more remembers his mother now than an eight-year-old horse. The tartness of his face sours ripe grapes. When he walks, he moves like an engine, and the ground shrinks before his treading. He is able to pierce a corslet with his eye, talks like a knell, and his hum is a battery. He sits in his state as a thing made for Alexander. What he bids be done is finished with his bidding. He wants nothing of a god but eternity and a heaven to throne in. Yes, mercy, if you report him truly. I paint him in the character. Mark what mercy his mother shall bring from him. There is no more mercy in him than there is milk in a male tiger. That shall our poor city find, and all this is long of you. The gods be good unto us. No, in such a case the gods will not be good unto us. When we banished him, we respected not them. And he, returning to break our necks, they respect not us. Enter a messenger. Sir, if you'd save your life, fly to your house. The plebeians have got your fellow tribune, and hail him up and down, all swearing. If the Roman ladies bring not comfort home, they'll give him death by inches. Enter a second messenger. What's the news? Good news, good news. The ladies have prevailed. The Volsians are dislodged, and Coriolanus gone. A merrier day did never yet greet Rome. No, not the expulsion of the Tarquins. Friend, art thou certain this is true? Is it most certain? As certain as I know the sun is fire. Where have you lurked that you make doubt of it? Ne'er through an arch so hurried the blown tide as the recomforted through the gates. Why hark you? Trumpets, hallboys, drums beat, all together. The trumpets, sackbuts, psalteries and fifes, tables and cymbals and the shouting Romans make the sun dance. Hark you! A shout within. This is good news. I will go meet the ladies. This Volumnia is worthy of consuls, senators, patricians, a city full. 
of tribunes such as you a sea and landful you have prayed well to-day this morning for ten thousand of your throats i'd not have given a doit hark how they joy music stale with shouts first the gods bless you for your tidings next accept my thankfulness sir we have all great cause to give great thanks they are near the city almost at point to enter we will meet them and help the joy Exeunt. scene five the same a street near the gate enter two senators with volumnia virgilia valeria etc passing over the stage followed by patricians and others behold our patroness the life of rome call all your tribes together praise the gods and make triumphant fires strew flowers before them unshout the noise that banish coriolanus repeal him with the welcome of his mother cry welcome ladies welcome welcome, welcome ladies, ladies welcome. Welcome. welcome a flourish with drums and trumpets exeunt scene six antium a public place enter tullus aphidius with attendants go tell the lords of the city i am here deliver them this paper having read it bid them repair to the market-place where i even in theirs and in the commons ears will vouch the truth of it him i accuse the city ports by this hath entered and intends to appear before the people hoping to purge herself with words dispatch exeunt attendants enter three or four conspirators of aphidius's faction most welcome how is it with our general even so as with a man by his own alms empoisoned and with his charity slain most noble sir if you do hold the same intent wherein you wished us parties will deliver you of your great danger sir i cannot tell we must proceed as we do find the people the people will remain uncertain whilst twixt you there's difference but the fall of either makes the survivor heir of all i know it and my pretext to strike at him admits a good construction i raised him and i pawned mine honour for his truth who being so heightened he watered his new plants with dews of flattery seducing so my friends and to this end he bowed his nature never known before but to be rough unswayable and free sir his stoutness when he did stand for consul which he lost by lack of stooping that i would have spoke of being banished for it he came unto my hearth presented to my knife his throat i took him made him joint servant with me gave him way in all his own desires nay let him choose out of my files his projects to accomplish mine best and freshest men served his designments in mine own person hope to reap the fame which he did end all his and took some pride to do myself this wrong till at the last i seemed his follower not partner and he waged me with his countenance as if i had been mercenary so he did my lord the army marvelled at it and in the last when he had carried rome and that we looked for no less spoil than glory there was it for which my sinews shall be stretched upon him at a few drops of women's room which are as cheap as lies he sold the blood and labour of our great action therefore shall he die and i'll renew me in his fall but hark drums and trumpets sound with great shouts of the people your native town you entered like a post and had no welcomes home but he returns splitting the air with noise and patient fools i whose children he hath slain their base throats tear with giving him glory therefore at your vantage ere he express himself or move the people with what he would say let him feel your sword which we will second when he lies along after your way his tale pronounced shall bury his reasons with his body say no more here come the lords enter the lords of the city you are most welcome home i have not deserved it but worthy lords have you with heed perused what i have written to you we have and grieve to hear it what faults he made before the last i think might have found easy fines but there to end where he was to begin and give away the benefit of our levies 
answering us with our own charge, making a treaty where there was a yielding, this admits no excuse. He approaches. You shall hear him. Enter Coriolanus, marching with drum and colours, commoners being with him. Hail, lords! I am returned your soldier, no more infected with my country's love than when I parted hence. But still subsisting under your great command, you are to know that prosperously I have attempted and with bloody passage led your wars, even to the gates of Rome. Our spoils we have brought home do more than counterpoise a full third part to the charges of the action. We have made peace with no less honour to the Antiates than shame to the Romans, and we here deliver, subscribed by the consuls and patricians, together with the seal of the senate, what we have compounded on. Read it not, noble lords, but tell the traitor, in the highest degree he hath abused your powers. Traitor? How now? I, traitor, Martius. Martius. I, Martius, Caius Martius. Dost thou think I'll grace thee with that robbery, thy stolen name Coriolanus in Corioli? You lords and heads of the state, perfidiously he has betrayed your business, and given up for certain drops of salt, your city Rome, I say your city, to his wife and mother, breaking his oath and resolution like a twist of rotten silk, never admitting counsel at the war, but at his nurse's tears he whined and roared away your victory, that pages blushed at him, and men of heart looked wondering at each other. Hearest thou, Mars? Name not the god, thou boy of tears. Ha! No more. Measureless liar, thou hast made my heart too great for what contains it. Boy, O oh slave, pardon me, lords, tis the first time that ever I was forced to scold. Your judgments, my grave lords, must give this cur the lie, and his own notion, who wears my stripes impressed upon him, that must bear my beating to his grave, shall join to thrust the lie unto him. Peace, both, and hear me speak. Cut me to pieces, Volsies, men and lads, stain all your edges on me. Boy, false hound, if you have writ your annals true, tis there that like an eagle in a dovecot I fluttered your Volsians in Corioli. Alone I did it, boy. Why, noble lords, will you be put in mind of his blind fortune, which was your shame, by this unholy braggart for your own eyes and ears? Let him die for Tear him to pieces! Tear him! Tear him! Tear him! Tear him! Yes! Tear him! Do it! Presently! Do it! Do it! He killed my father! Killed him! Peace! Ho! No outrage! Peace! The man is noble, and his fame folds in this orb of the earth. His last offences to us shall have judicious hearing. Stand, Alphidius, trouble not the peace. Oh, that I had him with six Alphidiuses, or more, his tribe, to use my lawful sword. Insolent villain! Kill, kill, him, him, kill, him, kill, him, kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! The conspirators draw and kill Coriolanus. Aphidius stands on his body. Hold! 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 My noble masters, hear me speak. O oh, Tullus! Thou hast done a deed whereat valour will weep. Tread not upon him. Masters all, be quiet. Put up your swords. My lords, when you shall know, as in this rage provoked by him you cannot, the great danger which this man's life did owe you, you will rejoice that he is thus cut off. Please it your honours to call me to your senate. I'll deliver myself your loyal servant, or endure your heaviest censure. Bear from hence his body, and mourn you for him. Let him be regarded as the most noble course that ever Harold did follow to his urn. His own impatience takes from Alphidius a great part of the blame. Let's make the best of it. My rage is gone, and I am struck with sorrow. Take him up. Help, three of the chiefest soldiers. I'll be one. Beat thou the drum that it speak mournfully. 
trail your steel pikes. Though in this city he hath widowed and unchilded many a one, which to this hour bewail the injury, yet he shall have a noble memory. Assist. Exeunt, bearing the body of Coriolanus. A dead march sounded. End of Act 5 End of Coriolanus by William Shakespeare